Will Putin launch an attack on the USA? The possibility of a Russian attack on the US has been a top national security concern for decades. Since the earliest days of the Cold War, US policymakers have run war games and maintained preparations for a range of possible attacks. Now, with the war in Ukraine raging and US-Russia relations at their worst point in decades, it is a question which has returned to the minds of many. While such an event is still extremely unlikely to occur, it raises several hypothetical questions. What could a limited or not so limited Russian attack on US assets look like? What's our best guess at how things might play out? And what chance, if any, would Russia stand in a real war against the American military and NATO? One thing's for sure, Putin is not happy about the West repeatedly coming to Ukraine's aid in the Russo-Ukrainian war, and with Russia's army failing miserably on the battlefield, it may only be a matter of time before Putin's threats to either back off and stop helping Ukraine or face a showdown start coming in. Here's how it could go down. It's late 2023. The Russian invasion of Ukraine has been raging for over a year and a half, with both sides taking enormous amounts of casualties. But armed with more and more Western firepower and training, the Ukrainian military has pushed Russian troops out of most of eastern Ukraine. Russia's mass conscription and brutal human wave tactics have not been enough, and it has lost nearly all of its conquered territory outside of Crimea. Increasingly desperate and fearing that oligarchs or commanders will soon topple him from power, Vladimir Putin decides to pull out all the stops. He threatens to do anything necessary to stop the West from further arming Ukraine and to regain Russia's historical sphere of influence, but most assume he is still bluffing. However, indications from US intelligence hint that this time it might be something more serious. Putin puts out a televised statement, claiming that the US and NATO have 72 hours to begin removing their on-the-ground trainers and Patriot missile systems to halt the flow of Western weapons into the country, and if they do not, Russia reserves the right to defend itself. President Joe Biden responds, saying that the West will not back down or be intimidated by Putin. For a brief moment, everyone falls silent, but the peace doesn't last long before the storm hits. Several days pass, with continued heavy fighting in Ukraine, but no more threats. Then, suddenly, an innocent software update from the week before crashes internal servers from the White House, Department of Defense, NATO High Command, and Ukrainian Armed Forces, as well as more than a dozen defense-associated companies using advanced malware. At the same time, a mass distributed denial of service, or DDoS attack, overwhelms secondary computer systems, flooding them with traffic and crashing them. On the malware-infected computers, a message appears demanding that the US halt its support of Ukraine or face further consequences. What now? According to experts like retired General Herbert Hawke Carlyle, former head of the Air Combat Command, such escalation in cyberspace would likely follow a period of heightened tensions and warnings, and in an all-out conflict, the US and NATO would have to initially counter Russian cyber capabilities. Because of advance warning from intelligence agencies, the US would most likely have the time to prepare for a physical Russian attack by increasing its combat capacity in both Europe and Alaska. But it could get darker. A conflict opening with a hostile cyber attack could come with much less warning and provide Russia with a small early advantage against vastly superior US and NATO capabilities. All right, so Putin is officially gearing up for a fight. What comes next? As US, NATO, and Ukrainian authorities scramble to bring their essential computer systems back online, intelligence agencies begin to pick up increased activity at Russian missile launch sites on both Ukrainian and Polish borders, as well as at major military installations around Vladivostok and Kaliningrad, at two ends of the country. In response to the cyber attack and troop movement, the Department of Defense moves the US to DEFCON 2. In this posture, only ever used during the 1962 Cuban Missile Crisis, the US would have the Army, Navy, and Air Force poised for combat and ready to deploy in hours. US and NATO Cyber Command then quickly mount a retaliatory cyber operation, which could involve substantial disruption of Russian communications and activation of malware attacks on critical computer systems, power grids, and military bases. But let's say Putin takes it a step further. As both Western and Russian computer systems are still recovering that same day, the Russian Air Force begins flying sorties into NATO airspace over Poland. Then, suddenly, Russian missiles fired from the border of Ukraine strike three airbases in Poland and Romania involved in supplying military assistance to Ukraine. 
Despite air defenses, there are roughly a dozen US and NATO casualties, and significant damage to the base's infrastructure. Some of the missiles miss their target and hit nearby areas, killing another dozen civilians. Putin releases a statement promising further such attacks on other targets if NATO and US assistance to Ukraine does not end. Within minutes, news of the attack reaches the US president, transmitted via a network of six jamming resistance satellites which provide real-time communications to the US, Canadian, Dutch, Australian, and British militaries. Let's pause for a moment to hear what military experts have to say about the likelihood of this type of event sequence. In a December 2022 paper, the RAND Corporation, the DOD's think tank, outlines three possible scenarios for a Russian first strike on a US or NATO target, demonstrative, focused, or less restrained. This hypothetical is their Scenario C, a focused attack, the third most severe of their four Russian strike possibilities. At this point, DOD and NATO leadership would have to decide whether to continue escalation and retaliate with kinetic strikes of their own or to back down and try to defuse the situation. Because of the severity of such an attack with casualties from multiple NATO members, US and NATO leaders would almost certainly decide the attack requires retaliation in kind to satisfy NATO members' concerns about the credibility of Article 5. In short, it's time to fight back. Advised to take early action, the President calls an emergency session of Congress, which within hours passes a joint resolution authorizing the limited use of military force against Russia and its allies. The President gives a televised speech stating that the US has taken its own retaliatory actions for the unprovoked attack, but that the US response is purely defensive. US ground forces will not enter Russia, he declares, in hopes of stopping escalation to the level of full war. The US therefore decides to launch a proportional response on Russian targets in Ukraine. Even before the speech is finished, two US-controlled Reaper drones take off from airbases in Poland. Once over Ukrainian airspace, they strike Russian airbases and missile defenses in Crimea, killing several dozen soldiers and destroying a number of planes. At the same time, the US launches a number of modified SM-3 missiles from its ships around the world, knocking out a handful of Russian communication satellites. This strike leaves Russia with limited GPS targeting and communications capabilities. So far, so good. But while Biden and other Western leaders urge Putin to back down and not escalate things anymore, they receive no answer. Putin decides he cannot back down now. The next day, two MiG-31 fighter jets enter Polish airspace. Before they can be destroyed, they fire Kinzhal hypersonic missiles, managing to hit two NATO missile batteries and killing another half-dozen soldiers. At the same time, all gas from the Nord Stream 2 pipeline is shut off, leaving millions of homes in Europe with no gas supply. By this point, escalation in Europe is nearly inevitable. NATO calls an emergency summit, and after two days of initial resistance from Turkey and several other states, Article 5 is officially invoked. But top NATO officials stress that their operations against Russia will be limited and purely defensive. Defensive, but powerful. With Article 5 invoked, the first priority of NATO troops is to take out Russian air defenses near Europe, before striking air bases and missile launch sites to try and stop shelling of NATO assets. So after multiple missile salvos from US submarines and aircraft carriers in the Black Sea and Mediterranean wipe out most of Russia's western surface-to-air defenses, fighter jets and long-range bombers from NATO countries begin to engage in aerial dogfights with Russian planes across Eastern Europe. The older Russian jets are quickly outmatched and outnumbered but combined with the remaining air defenses, they are still able to take out a handful of F-15s and other NATO assets. Fighting is especially concentrated around Western Poland and Kaliningrad, which NATO strikes repeatedly and declares a no-fly zone over. The massive US fleet of 650 tanker jets also takes off from North America and begins to circle the Atlantic, providing in-air refueling for more F-15s and F-16s called in from airbases in the US. American cargo planes also embark across the ocean, carrying troops, heavy vehicles, and supplies, which will be used to resupply the growing front in Eastern Europe. And this is just the beginning. At the same time, all US troops in Europe are recalled from leave to be mobilized. The US Army's 173rd Airborne Brigade Combat Team in Italy and its 2nd Cavalry Regiment in Germany join NATO forces from across Europe and engage Russian troops on the borders of Finland, Estonia, Latvia and Poland. While Russia's failures in Ukraine make the prospect of them taking another national capital doubtful at best, Russian missiles and artillery begin striking towns near the border,
causing immense damage to the area's infrastructure and killing dozens more civilians. More cyber attacks are also unleashed against the power grids in Estonia, Poland, and Lithuania, causing rolling blackouts. US air defenses in Poland are able to down some of the incoming missiles, but many which were fired indiscriminately still get through. Putin also orders a full-scale draft and mobilization of all young men in Russia, seeking to get cannon fodder to the front as quickly as possible. Great! More fresh-faced Russian conscripts heading to the front lines. Has Putin learned nothing from his past mistakes? Regardless, let's take a look at what's happening in Europe while all this is going on. As you can imagine, things get pretty bad. While many national leaders urge people to remain calm, commercial air and rail traffic in Eastern Europe grinds to a halt, and the stock market begins to crash, creating panic. Nord Stream gas remains cut off, and refugees fleeing the crisis also continue to move west, stoking fears of a mass humanitarian crisis across Europe. The UN continues to press for a ceasefire, but Putin says he will not back down until his demands are met, though he stops short of explicitly threatening nuclear action. Western leaders respond that he must immediately cease all military activity, withdraw, and stand down all Russian troops. They announce a range of crippling new sanctions against Russian businesses, individuals, and weapon suppliers. This alone may not stop Putin's aggression. Every bit of pressure that can be added to weaken Russia's strength and security could contribute to its eventual defeat. The following day, combined NATO and US forces, including armored brigades from Poland, head north to fully cut off Russia from Kaliningrad and encircle the exclave. With the US 6th and 7th fleets, moving into striking positions in the Black Sea and Pacific. While Russia could likely muster some ground troops outside of Ukraine, they would be unlikely to launch a full invasion of any Baltic country in a conflict with the US or NATO, especially since the Baltic troops are far from Russia's best. As noted by Mike Kaufman, Russia analyst at the Center for Naval Analysis, Russia's military modernization and force structure expansion had been ignoring the Baltic region until only recently. Despite provocative air and naval activity concentrated in the area, Russian forces based there are principally defensive and aging to boot. While many analysts still argued prior to the invasion of Ukraine that Russia could surround Baltic capitals in as little as 36 hours, those estimates have since come under serious doubt. In a serious confrontation with multiple NATO member states, Russia would likely take significant early losses and be forced to rely mostly on irregular warfare missile strikes and artillery. So back and forth missile strikes and aerial dogfights rage, along with artillery barrages and ground combat on Russia's borders with the Baltic states, while the United Nations continues to call for a ceasefire. Things are about to escalate. At this point, nearly a week into the growing conflict, Russia's resources are already strained to the point of total depletion. But Putin desperately needs something to make a statement and try to force the West to give him concessions. What will he do? Assuming that he does not opt for the nuclear option, fingers crossed, right? One possibility is to use Russia's vast geography to its advantage. So in an attempt to stretch out US resources, Russian fighter jets attempt to launch preemptive strikes against several US military installations in Alaska. These attacks are primarily aimed at disrupting communications and destroying military assets before they can be mobilized to attack Russia from the Pacific. While US missile defenses stop nearly all the strikes, several damaged U.S. communications arrays. Russia also launches another round of DDoS cyber attacks against U.S. computer networks in order to further disrupt communications and try to sow confusion among American forces. In addition to this, submarines from Russia's Pacific Fleet begin to move, putting more of their long-range missiles within striking range of U.S. bases in the Pacific. The U.S. Navy responds by moving the 3rd Fleet to strategic locations up and down the West Coast and the 7th Fleet into a blockade off Russia's eastern coast, as part of an effort to counter Russia's naval presence in the Pacific. The US Air Force launches bombers from bases in Japan, Guam, Hawaii, and Alaska towards key targets across eastern Russia, striking military facilities at Vladivostok, yuzno sakhalinsk Kamchatsky, Magadan, and elsewhere, while engaging enemy fighters over Alaska and northern Russia as part of a defensive operation against further strikes into American airspace. Because Russia has diverted many of its Pacific air defenses to the border with Ukraine, many US missiles find their targets, destroying numerous Russian air bases and communication centers. US Cyber Command also launches another round of cyber attacks against both Russian computer systems 
and missile silos, disabling more of them before they can be launched. Meanwhile, Allied US and NATO ground troops dig into defensive positions on their respective borders with Ukraine and Belarus, as tensions over nuclear weapons continues to mount. In response, Russian troops and Allied militias gather in Belarus, preparing to try and retake the Kaliningrad corridor, but by this point, much of Russia's communication infrastructure and military hardware is damaged or gone, and its forces stretched thin, forcing Putin to rely more heavily on asymmetric warfare or shock value. Desperate times call for desperate measures, sure, but do they work? The following day, Russian allied militia groups begin to launch guerrilla-style raids across the borders from Belarus, Kaliningrad, and Transnistria, attacking both civilian and military targets. Running out of both ammunition and artillery, they use improvised explosive devices, or IEDs, and other makeshift weapons to terrorize villages and towns. NATO forces respond with more heavy artillery and shelling and precision missile strikes for the next two days, aiming to cut off the flow of insurgents across the borders. Since Russia's military assets are now significantly depleted, its proxy forces fail to retake either the Kaliningrad Corridor or more territory in Ukraine. Despite the growing NATO casualties due to IEDs and other attacks, the insurgents are decimated by the relentless artillery strikes. In Ukraine, Troops take advantage of Russia's depleted resources to launch a lightning offensive into Crimea, shelling Sevastopol, and moving to cut off the peninsula from Russia. Meanwhile, in the east, Russia's Air Force and Pacific Fleet, as well as most of its communications arrays, have been crippled by the US, putting substantial pressure on Putin. In a last-ditch effort to overwhelm NATO and US resolve, Putin orders a third massive barrage of cyber attacks. The attacks target the wider power grid and are able to cause mass blackouts in cities across Europe and America, leaving millions without power, even as refugees continue to flood into Western Europe. EU and US officials declare a state of emergency and ask for humanitarian assistance from the other UN member states. Rolling blackouts last two days, during which time heavy fighting continues near Russia and Belarus's borders, both against regular troops and militia groups targeting civilians. Despite the cyber attacks, Russian allied troops continue to take far heavier losses than those of NATO and the US, and are pushed back from the edge of the Baltic states deeper into Russian territory. Holding to their word, NATO troops do not pursue them, but set up a heavily fortified buffer zone on the border. Then, after weeks of heavy shelling and being blockaded from air, land, and sea, the remaining Russian troops at Kaliningrad surrender, and the exclave is taken by NATO ground troops. In the east, the US blockade continues, as do retaliatory strikes on Russian communications and missile areas. But the surrender at Kaliningrad and mass attack on the European power grid continue to spread fears that the war will become a nuclear conflict between NATO allies and Russia. National leaders from around the world urge an end to the fighting. Despite this, Putin gives a speech raging against NATO's imperialism and says Russia will not back down if Kaliningrad is not returned to Russian control and Western support for Ukraine does not cease. With a global recession and refugee crisis deepening, the situation looks grim. Are all roads leading towards a full-blown nuclear war? After nearly two weeks of intense fighting between NATO allies and Russian allied forces, NATO leaders announce plans for a full-scale invasion into Belarus if Moscow does not withdraw its support for separatists operating within Ukraine and NATO territory immediately. This announcement comes on top of growing speculation about whether or not nuclear war might erupt between Moscow and Washington after days of escalating combat between both sides, and the mass Russian disruption to European power grids. But despite his cyber attack, at this point Putin is out of options. Most of Russia's military capabilities have been destroyed, and there are critical shortages of ammunition, equipment, food, medicine, and other essentials. In under two weeks, Russia has lost tens of thousands more troops compared to the relatively light losses by NATO and the US. Its Pacific Fleet and Eastern military installations have been wiped out by the US, and in the West, it has lost control of both Kaliningrad and much of Crimea, putting the critical naval base of Sevastopol under Ukrainian control. The only major city in Ukraine still held by Russia is Mariupol, where its remaining occupation troops are dug in trying to avoid artillery and drone strikes. Most Russian forces have been forced to pull back miles from the border, where they continue to face shelling, and hospitals are completely overwhelmed. Supply lines are so destroyed that many unlucky soldiers have even begun to starve. As conditions worsen in the next few days, Putin's war effort begins its inevitable collapse. 
substantial numbers of Russian troops begin to surrender or mutiny, refusing to follow orders and turning themselves over as prisoners. Finally, buckling under pressure and trying to save face, Putin announces that Russia has taught the West a lesson and is open to negotiations. An emergency session of the UN Security Council is convened several days later, where plans begin to be drawn up for a ceasefire, the return of Kaliningrad to Russian control, autonomy for areas of eastern Ukraine, and the creation of a demilitarized zone along the Russian border. Although this is just one hypothetical scenario for a US-NATO-Russia conflict, which is still very unlikely, it demonstrates some of the options available to both sides in open conventional warfare. An extremely outmatched Russia would likely have to rely on asymmetric strategies, but even that would likely do little to halt the combined efforts of the US military and NATO. With their combined firepower, logistical strength, and technology, there is almost no non-nuclear scenario where Russia could hold its own militarily. Even so, this example illustrates the devastating toll on human life that could result from even a short, conventional war. But what do you think? What would happen if Russia attacked the US? Let us know your thoughts in the comments below, and don't forget to subscribe for more military content. Throughout the 21st century, Russia and China's economic ties have openly deepened. However, the relationship between these two superpowers is a strenuous one, and it wouldn't take much to make them mortal enemies. What would it take? And if either of these two countries did attack each other, what would prompt them to do so? And who would win? While neither country is willing to admit the reality of their relationship, the signs are there. To understand them, we need to delve into their geopolitical histories. Both countries have long traditions, rich in warfare and attempts to claim superiority in their respective regions. For Russia, that's the Great Eurasian Steppe. Russia's historical ties to the steppe can be traced back to its origins as an Eastern Slavic country. However, the geography of northeastern Europe is steeped in low-lying flatland that is incredibly difficult to defend against invaders due to its sheer size and exposure. And Russia has been on the receiving end of many invasions, with perhaps the most notable being the Napoleonic Wars. Although Russia fended off the French, it showcased the relative ease with which the European part of Russia could be attacked via the Germanic lands. That's why Russia has spent considerable resources to secure its European borders and relations, which came to a head in the 20th century with the USSR. Apart from being at its peak territorially, Russia held diplomatic ties with most of Eastern Europe through the Warsaw Pact, which elevated its influence over most of the Eurasian steppe. But the situation didn't last. With the USSR dissolving and many European countries joining the US-led NATO, Russia's borders of influence were equated to its actual borders, perilously close to the country's main population centers in Europe. China's territory has ebbed and flowed over the millennia. China's current policy seems focused on claiming parts of territories it has historically owned, including but not limited to Taiwan, parts of India in the Himalayas, and swathes of the South China Sea. These territorial disputes have brought the US and several Indo-Pacific countries together to form the Quadrilateral Security Dialogue (QSD) or the Quad to curb China's influence in the area. The main thorn in China's internal and external diplomacy is Taiwan technically led by the Republic of China, which it considers a rebellious remnant of the country that needs to be brought back into the fold. However, Taiwan has the military and diplomatic backing of the US. If China decided to abandon diplomacy and invade Taiwan, it would be no doubt met by US armed Taiwanese forces, with the rest of the Quad following close behind. This would likely create a prolonged war similar to the ongoing Russo-Ukrainian conflict. Further complicating China's foreign policy is its robust yet fragile domestic industry. As a country with the second largest population on Earth, China is woefully lacking in natural resources to support that many people working and producing for the economy. China imports most of its oil and natural gas, as well as mineral, drinking water and timber. What makes the US particularly dangerous to China's economy is the fact that most of its oil and natural gas supplies come through shipments from the Persian Gulf. Furthermore, a vast majority of this sea traffic has to pass through the tightly controlled Strait of Malacca. To salvage the situation, China claims most of the South China Sea, almost up to the strait itself, and opposes most other countries with access to the ocean. Still, if China decided to attack Taiwan or seriously try to control its portions of the South or East China Sea, it would no doubt be opposed by the Indo-Pacific countries. As a result, the strait would likely be shut off to Chinese vessels. 
This would cripple the Chinese resource-demanding economy and would likely result in the country's collapse as we know it, with unfathomable consequences for world politics. With opposition from all sides, it would seem natural that Russia and China would become allies, in an attempt to curb the American influence on its borders. NATO for Russia, the Quad for China. However, this is the point where history gets complex. You see, while China and Russia are currently presenting a united front against the US, their historical ties are more hostile than you might think. Even when both countries were communist in the mid-20th century, the regimes clashed over their interpretation of Marxism-Leninism. But the most contested Chinese-Russian relations are due to two treaties in the mid-19th century. During the 19th and the first half of the 20th century, Imperial China was under heavy political, diplomatic, and military pressure from colonial and foreign imperial forces, starting with the Opium Wars and ending with the country's reinvention as the Communist People's Republic of China. The 110 years of opposition from the West has been dubbed as the Century of Humiliation by the Chinese, with many politicians repeatedly citing all the losses China suffered during that period. As part of the Century of Humiliation, China was forced to sign several so-called unequal treaties, in which China had to cede parts of its territory, control, or other diplomatic material. With Russia in particular, the two most important treaties were the 1858 Treaty of Aigun and the 1860 Treaty of Peking, which resulted in China losing the province of Outer Manchuria. While Chinese officials claim that the province isn't a point of contention, reality begs to differ. The division made by the two treaties was somewhat ambiguous, resorting to using the two main rivers in the region, Amur and Usuri, as borders between Russia and China. However, Russia claims that all the islands in the river belong to Russia, while China claims that the border goes through the middle of the rivers, assigning the islands to a country based on its location against the middle of the river. In fact, the entire area has been hotly contested by China. Even in the 20th century, a seven-month military conflict between the Chinese and the Russians took place over the contested islands, particularly the Zenbao or Damansky Island on the Asuri. The two-week battle over Zenbao resulted in hundreds of casualties on both sides and created more than three and a half decades of tension over the islands. Furthermore, the sedimentary island, called Bolshoi Uzariski Island or Haixazi Island, has also been a sore spot in China's history. It stands in the confluence of the rivers, right on the border between the two countries. Claims over the island's territory have been going on since the treaties. Eventually, the two countries ratified the control of the island in a 2004 agreement that split the island between them and permitted China to use the Amur and Usor rivers for ship traffic. However, it seems China hasn't caught up to the agreement just yet. In a map published in 2023, China displayed the entirety of the Bolshoi Uzariski Island as being under Chinese control. While this may have been an oversight, it could also mean that China has plans regarding the previously debated region. The island itself is an undeveloped piece of land and would be an afterthought were it not for its favorable geographical position. Lying at the confluence of Amur and Usuri, the island is perilously close to Khabarovsk, the second largest city in Outer Manchuria, which overlooks the island. Since Russia controls the portion of the island on the confluence of Amur and Asuri, it can also control the shipping routes that are usable when the river isn't iced over. The Amur also has considerable hydroelectric and fishing capacity, something that China could greatly use due to its reliance on energy imports. Additionally, China's Ministry of Natural Resources has issued a statement relabeling cities and provinces in the Outer Manchuria region, which belongs to Russia, with Chinese names, usually historical ones from before the treaties. While it might seem that the region is relatively useless to China, you have to keep the bigger picture in mind. Outer Manchuria is one of the most populated and industrialized regions of the Russian Far East, with two cities having over 600,000 inhabitants, Khabarovsk and Vladivostok. The region is inhabited by around 4 million people, half of the entire Russian Far East population, compared to over 100 million people in the neighboring Chinese provinces. If war were to break out, China would have a massive initial manpower advantage, and the people could easily inhabit the sparsely populated Russian region after the fact. What makes Outer Manchuria a possible first front of the Sino-Russo War is also the aforementioned fact that China is a relatively resource-deprived nation. Since there are roughly 1 billion people in the country, China has a massive resource demand for energy, minerals, and even drinking water. Currently, most of the country, even though it contains some of the biggest rivers in the world, can barely produce enough to satisfy the population's need. Additionally, the biggest population center in the North China Plain has pretty much no natural drinking water supply, 
relying on the rest of the country and imports for its drinking water sources. As a result, China is looking for ready water supplies elsewhere, with two lucrative options – India and Russia. With pre-existing territorial disputes with India, China could potentially look into invading the water-rich Himalayan region it stakes a claim to. However, India itself houses the largest population in the world and faces a similar water scarcity problem, relying on the same region for drinking water. This makes the country much more defensive of the contested territory. Add to that the fact that India is in the Quad and also has beneficial trade relations with the West, and the US Quad and NATO would come down hard on China if it started an invasion on Indian soil. This leaves Russia as one of the key interest points for acquiring more resources. In terms of drinking water, Siberia is generally river-rich. However, by far the largest concentration of drinking water is in Lake Balkai, the biggest lake by volume, outstripping all Great Lakes combined, with estimates suggesting it could support the world population for decades by itself. In fact, a Chinese company aggressively purchased land around the lake in the 2010s, with plans to construct a pipeline and supply China with fresh water in 2017. The local population protested about the construction, and the Russian government intervened, forcing the Chinese company to abandon any plans to build up Lake Balkai. This doesn't mean that China will keel over. With its economy highly dependent on resources that it currently needs to import, and much of its oil and natural gas imports coming from either the Strait of Malacca or Russia itself, China might look to remove one of the middlemen from the equation. Since its south is bound in overseas territorial disputes and influenced by US foreign policies, Russia might be the next obvious choice. Without a Manchuria as the entryway, China could gain access to the entire Siberian region, which is rich in oil, natural gas, minerals, timber and water. All the resources the country desperately needs to function. Furthermore, with the Russian Far East so far removed from the population and influence centers in Europe, and the Russian army currently embroiled in its own war with Ukraine, China could consider invading Russia at any moment. This way, Beijing would gain the upper hand and succeed in a quick war, the kind Putin previously failed to accomplish in Ukraine two years prior. Remember, most of the issues that Russia is facing right now in Ukraine are due to intervention from NATO countries. The same issues that likely won't provide Russia with any assistance against China. However, a Chinese invasion might prompt the US and the Quad to exercise their own plans to cut off China in the south possibly creating a chain reaction of war declarations similar to that of the World Wars. Additionally, Outer Manchuria and the Siberian region by extension would provide China with greater access to the Pacific coastline through the Sea of Japan or the Russian Pacific coastline itself. In fact, if China were determined to bring the entirety of the Russian Far East under its own control, it could gain access to the Arctic shore itself. This is vital for an entirely different reason. You see, the main shipping routes around Eurasia and Africa currently rely on the Suez Canal and the Strait of Hormuz, followed by the Strait of Malacca, to transport goods between Western Europe and the Indo-Pacific. Alternatively to the Suez-Hormuz line would be the Cape of Good Hope, Southern Horn of Africa, a route that is around 4,000 nautical miles longer. But the Arctic contains a sea and a lot of ice that's navigable for at least a part of the year during warmer months when the ice cover is smaller. While the Arctic was previously relatively unused for maritime transport for that reason, global warming has changed the situation rapidly. A change of even a few degrees Celsius has been enough to drastically reduce the ice sheet over the Arctic Circle and open up previously inaccessible waters to ships. The Russian-controlled Northern Sea Route is currently the biggest and the shortest trading route in the region, with the other option going through the Northwest Route in Alaskan and Canadian waters. According to some studies, Arctic routes could be between 30 and 50% shorter, either in time spent at sea or distance, than those using the Suez or Panama canals, while eliminating the possible bottlenecks at the two artificial channels, a fact that became painfully obvious in the Evergreen incident in 2021. The tenuous geopolitics in Russia leave it open for influence from both the West, with which it is in a proxy war through Ukraine, and China, where it sells oil, gas, and other resources for the much-needed capital to fuel its economy and military efforts. The current situation plays well into China's hands, giving them unparalleled reach into Siberia through ongoing trade, all without actually needing to invest resources in invading the country or forcing Russia to accept the deal. With Russia stuck in a prolonged war it seemingly has no way of getting out of, it was forced to sell oil and gas to China at roughly half the rate it did to European countries. Naturally, this gives China a clear economic benefit from the Russo-Ukrainian war. 
As such, it works in China's favor to have Russia occupy the US and EU military efforts into Ukraine, while at the same time siphoning the resources it needs from Russia without resorting to trade through the Strait of Malacca. This has led to China famously not condemning Russia's invasion of Ukraine and abstaining in any peace talks or dialogues to end the war in the region. It's quite clear that Putin's regime is working out well for China and the country will likely remain a stern ally so long as the situation doesn't change. Furthermore, while the previous two years might have led everyone to believe Russia has a robust economy and is a veritable superpower in its own right, the truth is a bit more nuanced. Russia's population is roughly one-tenth of China's, and while the countries have a comparable GDP gross domestic product per capita, China's size gives it a clear edge. In fact, in current estimates, China is the world's second-largest economy, while Russia makes it to 11th place by total GDP. The economic disparity and Russia's military, economic, and diplomatic losses that followed the invasion of Ukraine make any deals fall naturally in China's favor. So long as Russia is cut off from the rest of the world financially, it's forced to accept China's terms in order to sell its resources and power its economy. However, the melting Arctic ice might put a dent in that plan. If Russia were able to operate independent shipping year-round and impose tariffs on goods traveling through the northeast route, it could create a secondary stream of income and gain a semblance of economic independence from China. Additionally, just because Russia's current regime is favorable to China doesn't mean that the situation will stay that way. The war in Ukraine might be protracted, but it won't last forever, and Russia might reconsider its allegiance to China in the long run and cut off resource export to China from its far east. Many experts believe that Russia doesn't have the military power to press further into Ukraine in 2024. With Ukraine steadily holding on to the support it receives from the EU and NATO, the war might be reaching a breaking point within the next few years. While there are a few possibilities on how the war will end, one of the predictions is that Russia's current regime will collapse. This will pave the way for a different leadership, with a potentially revolutionary outlook on Russia's long-term future in both Europe and Asia. The leadership might align itself more with Europe, China, or a third party altogether, and some of those scenarios might stop it from playing right into China's hands. If Russia does end up weakened enough from the Ukrainian war or start opposing its ongoing trade with China, then China wouldn't have many options left, since the current regime under Xi is fervently opposed to the influence radiating from the US onto the Indo-Pacific, the resource-starved Chinese will need to obtain more goods from its north, i.e. Russia. This circles back to the seemingly solved dispute between Russia and China on the matter of which country controls parts of Outer Mancuria. While China has gained back most of the territories it lost during the century of humiliation, the provinces of Outer Mancuria are still under Russian control. Given that China is still pressing claims on areas it had long lost any legal ties on and are loosely historically connected to China, such as the claims in the South China Sea, it's highly likely to reverse course on its previous agreements with Russia and claim back the lost provinces in Manchuria. Considering the present economic and demographic inequality between the regions separated by the Amur and Asuri, China's invasion would likely be swift and deadly. In all likelihood, it would displace or culturally assimilate the Russians in the area before reinforcements from the European parts of Russia could arrive. Since the area is already starting to be influenced by China due to ongoing trade, it's also possible that China might imitate the Russian annexation of Crimea to gain access to the Japanese Sea. Alternatively, it might begin its advance into the rest of the Russian Far East. In essence, what is currently happening in Ukraine could be repeated in the way Russia wants to diversify its port access and limit the influence of other countries on its economy, China could do the same thing in the future to Russia. With Russia weakened from the war, it's unlikely to remain the world's 11th economy for long and will likely be shattered by conflicting ideologies from within. That would leave Russia underpopulated, underrepresented, and underdeveloped. Yet the resource-rich and highly lucrative Far East will be ripe for the taking by the country that stands to gain the most from utilizing those resources. China. The only question that remains is how China will actually attack Russia. While China's current policy is non-interference, the country could reverse that course and try to sponsor a deal between Russia and Ukraine. During peace accords, China may impose its own influence on both Russia and Ukraine, forcing either country to accept whatever terms China deems best for its own agenda. In exchange, China would fund reconstruction and reinvigoration efforts in the war-struck areas of Ukraine. On the surface, the EU would likely welcome this deal, as Ukraine's reconstruction efforts are most likely going to be funded by the EU. 
talks about the country joining the EU in an expedited process have been underway for some time. This would also suit China's plans to undercut the US influence around the world. If the EU doesn't have to support yet another country and can rely on Chinese-brought infrastructure in Ukraine, the US doesn't have as much leverage. While the EU is currently importing Norwegian and American oil and gas, the end of the Russo-Ukrainian war could drastically change the trading routes on a global scale. With Russia free to resume exporting oil and gas to Europe, the US will lose one of its biggest export partners. It's currently unknown whether Russia can actually satisfy the needs of both China and the EU, but China could support the trade if it retains its influence on Russian politics and economy. Even if China doesn't create a lucrative offer to end the Russo-Ukrainian war, it could end the war forcefully by pulling the plug on economically supporting Russia. While Russia would likely retaliate by cutting off the resources from Siberia, China could open up claims to Outer Mancuria as a proxy. By invading Russia, it can take hold of the resources itself and cut out the middleman from the equation. Before long, China could feasibly gain access to the Sea of Japan or even freezing Siberian ports in the Arctic, allowing it to bypass the Strait of Malacca and place its products directly into Western Europe. In the end, while Russia and China's current stance is that the countries have an alliance, in actuality, Russia is only a few steps away from becoming China's vassal or being attacked by China's numerically superior forces while being completely unprotected from Europe. Then it's up to China to decide what claims it would pursue and to the US and the rest of the Quad to determine how to proceed in creating a new world order. It should be mentioned that all of these scenarios are only rough approximations or conjectures. Each one is based on the current events in Russia, Ukraine, and the geopolitics surrounding the China-US rivalry in the Indo-Pacific. If something drastically changes in the foreign policies of either of the parties, China could be facing a much worse war against the entirety of the US and the Quad before it strikes against Russia. But what do you think? Is China going to attack Russia, or is it still too afraid of American countermeasures? In the event China does attack, will it press far into Siberia or settle by regaining the region of Outer Mancuria? Let us know in the comments section below. Don't forget to like and subscribe for more military content from military experts. Hour Zero Sitting in his office surrounded by his most trusted advisors, Xi Jinping feels ready. Over the past decade or more, he's spent billions upon billions modernizing China's military. His nation now has nuclear weapons, around 500 of them, and he's built one of the world's largest navies. Add to that the fact that China's military has more active members than any other nation, with 2.35 million people to call on. He's going to bring war to the United States. But to do so, he has to carefully coordinate attacks throughout the Pacific. He knows that the United States has bases in Japan and South Korea, around 190 in those two countries alone, and a powerful navy that, though smaller than his, packs a lot more firepower. A full frontal assault on the United States without taking care of those problems first would be suicide. He needs to secure the Pacific, giving China a route toward the American mainland as a priority. His attack doesn't begin with missile launches. It starts on the cyber front. For years, China has been working on cyber technology that would allow it to hack into American infrastructure and military defense systems, limiting America's response to an attack in the process. On occasion, China gets caught out. In December 2023, for instance, the United States conducted an operation to disrupt a network of small office home office or SOHO routers that China had taken control of using the KV botnet to mask its hacking activities. That was unfortunate for Xi. But it won't stop the first stage of his attack. Xi gives the OK and dozens of cyber attacks begin. Chinese hackers work feverishly, targeting American water systems, electrical grids, and communication systems, with a special focus on any that are located near key military installations. Further attacks take place within the networks of companies that provide critical services to America's military, as well as attacks on systems and transportation methods that will be used by the United States to deliver aid to Taiwan in the case of a Chinese invasion. That last step is critical. To reach the United States, China has to secure a passage through the Pacific. Taiwan, which China has claimed for decades should be part of the People's Republic anyway, is chosen as the main target. By securing that island, China can break through the nations in the Pacific that are allied to the United States, including Japan and South Korea, and clear its route to the American mainland. Hour 1. The United States is scrambling. It's no stranger to Chinese hackers, but it's never faced an operation of this scale before. 
the country's success against Vault Typhoon, the elite group of Chinese hackers that were responsible for the KV botnet attacks mentioned earlier, revealed that China has its fingers in major networks. Rail, mass transit, maritime, water, and pipeline systems were all under threat. And though Vault Tycoon has been mostly eradicated, the sheer scale of the disruption occurring in the US reveals that it was far from the only hacker group China had in play. America is left chasing shadows at least for a couple of hours, which is all China needs to start the next stage of its assault. Xi Jinping gives the okay for the next and boldest part of its strategy, activating the People's Liberation Army Rocket Force, or PLARF. The group has around 120,000 members, who combine to operate six known ballistic missile bases throughout China. However, the PLARF's real strength lies in the sheer number of missiles it has at its disposal. Recent estimates from the US Naval Institute place the number at somewhere around 4,000, all of which are capable of targeting ships moving at sea in addition to static land-based targets. Both capabilities will be needed by Xi. In arranging this attack, he's had to make some difficult decisions. He knew that a launch against Taiwan was inevitable, and the island nation became his first target. A missile barrage begins, with air support being provided by the recently upgraded bases at Longchan, Jiangsu, and Huan. All three are supporting China with fleets of Shenyang J-16 fighters launching missiles of their own while engaging Taiwanese defenses in the air. The tougher attacks focus on the US Pacific Fleet. Numbering around 200 ships, along with 1,500 aircraft and 150,000 military personnel, that fleet is the biggest barrier that stands in the way of Xi's ambitions to invade the United States. It covers almost half of the world's surface, stretching from Antarctica to the Arctic Circle, taking in the Pacific Ocean and the Indian Ocean in the process. Xi can't hit everything in that fleet, but his goal is to strategically weaken the fleet in the early hours of his new war, eliminating America's ability to rapidly respond to his actions. To do that, he needs a three-pronged missile attack. First, he has to engage the naval bases the United States has set up in Japan, South Korea, and the Philippines. It's a risky move. Any missile strike on these nations will surely cause collateral damage, potentially bringing all three of them into the war in support of the US. But failure to strike now means leaving nearly 200 bases ready to launch an immediate counterattack supported by around 79,000 troops. Xi can't take that risk. Hordes of Dongfeng-26 or DF-26 missiles are launched towards America's bases in Japan and South Korea. Each missile has a range of 2,485 miles, easily ensuring they can reach their targets. They are accompanied by shorter-range missiles such as the DF-16 for a simple reason. Xi needs his DF-26s for attacks further afield. Those very missiles are also part of the second part of China's missile barrage, attacking closer to the United States. More are sent flying toward Guam, targeting the Anderson Air Force Base in Yigo, as well as naval base Guam in Santa Rita. Xi also unleashes the new jewel in China's missile crown to strike Hawaii. The DF-27 is a hypersonic missile that can just about reach America's east coast and is capable of evading US missile defenses. It'll be Xi's chief weapon when attacking the American mainland, at least during the early stages of the war. Finally, the third strike attacking American ships that are currently in the Pacific. Chief among the targets will be the small fleet of cruisers America has in the water near China, including the USS Shiloh and USS Mobile Bay. All told, there are nine of these ships, all packed with heavy armaments and strong anti-air defenses that China hopes to either eliminate or damage heavily. Secondary targets include the much larger fleet of US Navy destroyers, which pack less of a punch than the country's cruisers but will still be enough to cause serious damage to the Chinese fleet if they're allowed to go unchecked. There are dozens to target and Xi knows that he won't be able to take out all of them, but the more he can destroy with missiles now, the easier he'll find his invasion of Taiwan and subsequent passage to America. However, Xi's missiles won't have clear paths to their target. Though his cyber attacks have left the United States scrambling, it hasn't shut down the country's missile defense systems. America's DSP satellites, overseen by its Space Force, easily detect China's missile launches, giving President Joe Biden time to organize the country's defenses. Chief among these will be its ground-based interceptors, or GBIs, of which there are currently 44 active in the United States. Most of these systems, 40, are stationed in Alaska, though they're still capable of destroying intercontinental ballistic missiles, ICBMs, traveling at around 15,000 miles per hour. 
The other four are stationed in California, much closer to China's Hawaiian targets, and will be responsible for providing most of America's defenses against China's missile barrage. There's just one problem. What if any of the missiles contain nuclear warheads? Biden consults his advisors, who conclude that possibility is unlikely. American satellites show that the missiles are on course to hit its Pacific bases and Hawaii, suggesting a conventional strike. If Xi were going nuclear, his ICBMs would be on their way to Washington and other key strategic locations in the American mainland. Right now, the strategy is clear. Evacuate troops from the anticipated strike zones and hunker down. A counterattack will come, but at present, the US has to rely on its missile defense systems. Across the Pacific, Xi watches and waits, as the first of his missile barrages travel toward their targets in Japan and South Korea. Both have activated their missile defense systems to guard America's bases, with the platform they rolled out alongside the US toward the end of 2023, giving them advanced notice of the missiles China has launched. Many get shot out of the sky, falling harmlessly into the Pacific, but the sheer number of Chinese missiles overwhelms the defenses. Okinawa is practically destroyed. As home to most of America's overseas military in Japan, it was the chief target of these strikes. At the Kadena Air Base, missiles rained down on F-15 Eagle fighters, E-3 sentry planes, and KC-135 Stratotankers. The latter are especially important targets. They'll limit America's ability to refuel its aircraft in the air, restricting them to using the bases that China is so steadfastly attacking. The strike could be considered a success, killing thousands of American troops in the process. But Xi knows the bases aren't fully out of commission. He can't launch a ground-based invasion just yet, meaning the surviving crews at these bases will be able to rebuild quickly enough to continue to serve as launching points for the US Air Force. That's okay, he only needs them down for a few days. More missiles make their way toward cruisers and destroyers that the US has stationed in the Pacific. These ships are a little harder to strike, not least because they're not remaining still. Orders from American command have told all to start moving in erratic patterns, hoping to send Chinese missiles off course in the process. The tactic works in some cases, though not in others. China is successful in cutting down about half of America's cruisers, as well as several dozen destroyers. Again, a qualified success for Xi. A few minutes later, China's DF-27 and DF-26 missiles are drawing nearer to Hawaii. Dozens are shot out of the sky by California's missile defense systems, but they can't provide complete coverage. Many more break through, striking ships including the USS Frank E. Peterson and USS Hopper. Xi had hoped his strike would also take out at least some of the 13 submarines stationed in Hawaii, but no such luck. Even with his cyber attacks wreaking havoc, the commanders and crews of those submarines received orders to submerge underwater, safe from the missile barrage, until the US was ready to fight back. By the end of the first few hours of the conflict, China has expended nearly a quarter of its 4,000 missiles. It has wreaked devastation on the American bases in Asia, though at the cost of drawing Japan and South Korea into Xi's war. America's Pacific fleet has been severely weakened, with Xi's cyber attacks also limiting the speed in which the US can respond to what he's going to do next. The strike's success wasn't total, but it was enough. Day 2 Having bought himself some time with his attack on the United States, leaving his main enemy in a temporary state of disarray, Xi can focus on his immediate target, Taiwan. China has spent the last day battering Taiwan with short-range missiles. The barrage has been successful in taking out several targets, including the smaller islands surrounding Taiwan, but it's also faced a steadfast defense from the US-made Patriot Air Defense System stationed on the island, as well as Taiwan's own Skybo surface-to-air ballistic missile defense systems. Still, the barrage will have to end soon, if only because Xi wants to send ground troops in to take the island. He can't risk killing his own people in friendly fire situations. After a 24-hour bombardment in which China expends hundreds of missiles, Xi assesses the damage he's caused. Crucially, his attacks on America's overseas bases, as well as America itself, will delay its navy in reaching the Taiwan Strait. And the missiles he's fired at Taiwan have severely weakened its naval defenses, while fighter planes from Longchan, Zhengzhou, and Huan keep the country's air force occupied. He feels ready to start landing troops on the Taiwanese mainland, but therein he finds a problem. His landing options are limited. That's partially due to the actions of Taiwan's president, Tsai Ing-wen. She's been preparing for an attack from China for several months, especially in the wake of Beijing growing bolder by conducting military and naval operations in the Taiwan Strait. 
As soon as the missiles started flying, Tsai sent orders to defensive positions on both sides of the island. To the east, Taiwan benefits from having an extensive network of cliffs. Tsai anticipates that Xi will look to blockade that side of the island with his navy, but is unlikely to launch a full invasion from the east. Still, soldiers are placed on alert, telling them to prepare to fight against ground troops that might try to climb the cliffs, which have gradients of at least 15%. If need be, those troops will receive orders to destroy the routes built through the cliffs that lead to the mainland. Her main focus lies in Taiwan's west. As the coast closest to China, it's going to be the point of ingress into the island. Tsai places all 15 major ports and harbors on that coast on high alert, with orders for their destruction in place if China's forces get near. Tsai can't afford to allow China to set up a naval presence on the island itself if it manages to invade. Then there are Taiwan's beaches. All are heavily fortified, with any Chinese troops that manage to land having to make their way through scores of barbed wire-laden defenses just to achieve any hope of reaching the roads that lead to Taipei. The waters leading to most of those beaches are less than 50 feet deep, meaning China can't land troops en masse. It must take them most of the way before ferrying them across in smaller vessels, all while being subjected to missile fire from Taiwan. Those waters are also packed with shallow mines, with the beaches also containing anti-landing spikes that will prevent China's tanks from making inroads. And if worst comes to worst, Tsai can collapse the roads leading into Taipei from the west, forcing Chinese troops to navigate challenging terrain if they ever hope to reach Taiwan's capital. Tsai is going to make this a war of attrition, and that spells bad news for Xi. Day 3. The United States is almost ready to counter the initial Chinese offensive. But before it does, Biden puts on his diplomatic hat as he prepares to exploit a key weakness in Xi's plan. One of China's biggest challenges in the war is economic. The country relies heavily on importing goods, spending $2.56 trillion in 2023 alone. Biden has spent the last three days organizing heavy sanctions against China, with America's network of allies finally paying off. China will not only struggle to import goods and equipment from the United States, but it'll also be cut off from its European trade partners, all agree to not sell to or buy from China, essentially creating a blockade for as long as the war lasts. That blockade extends to oil. China imports 11.8 million barrels of oil per day to keep itself running. Much of that oil comes from Russia, which is now responsible for about 19% of the oil China buys annually. However, the other 81% comes from countries like Saudi Arabia, which are allied to the United States, leveraging diplomatic pressure as well as the concerns that other Asian nations such as Saudi Arabia have related to Chinese expansion. Biden is able to cut off most of the oil reaching China. Yes, Russia will supply Xi, though it isn't able to cover the massive shortfall that results from America's sanctions. And given Putin's war in Ukraine, he also can't risk Russia's trade with other countries for the sake of solely supporting China especially given that he faces his own sanctions. Xi didn't expect this. Now he faces a shutdown. China has to defeat the United States in a matter of months, or else its resources will dwindle to the point where it's practically starved out of the fight that it started. Day 4. With sanctions in place and trade routes in the process of being cut off, Biden's next move is to speak to his allies in NATO. After all, China directly attacked America on its own soil by launching missiles at Hawaii. It also attacked America-owned military bases overseas, which would also constitute an attack on the US. All of this plays in Biden's favor for one reason. Article 5 of the NATO Charter According to this article, if any NATO ally or member nation is the victim of an armed attack by another country, every other NATO member will consider this an act of violence against themselves. In short, China's attack on the United States has brought most of Europe into the fold. Biden has been cooperating with NATO members from the moment he detected China's missiles. Collectively, that makes him ready to utilize the power of 31 nations, including what's left of the United States defenses. The focal point of the counterattack is obvious, the Taiwan Strait. Xi has failed to take Taiwan with his missile barrage and now faces an extended conflict in which he's losing thousands of troops every day to his attempts to land on Taiwanese beaches. Even if he manages to break through Taiwan's defenses by simply throwing sheer numbers at the island, his troops will face an urban warfare campaign that will see them fight tooth and nail for every street they manage to claim. Xi didn't expect this. And this war of attrition all adds up to time that the US and its allies can take to prepare an attack. 
The strategy is to combine America's naval resources with those of its NATO allies, as well as the navies of South Korea, Japan, and Australia. The latter will also be a focal point of the counterattack, as China neglected to destroy the bases America has set up in Australia. The United States sends a fleet of ships, including most of its stock of 11 aircraft carriers, toward the Taiwan Strait. They're accompanied by one of the UK's aircraft carriers, the HMS Queen Elizabeth, loaded with Typhoon FGR-4 and F-35B Lightning jets. Similar support comes from Canada, which commits half of its 12 frigates to the American cause, as well as Japan, which sends most of its fleet of 36 destroyers. South Korea hesitates. It's happy to support the US in any way that it can, but it also has to be wary of North Korea, which could see China's attack as an opportunity for it to start a war with its southern neighbor. If South Korea commits its naval or aerial resources to America now, it leaves itself open to attack. Biden understands this, resulting in South Korea's role being to keep watch over North Korea to ensure it doesn't get involved in the conflict. And now, the US has an allied fighting force that's capable of fighting against China in the sea or air. The fleet sets sail. Week 2. Xi has been bombarding Taiwan to no avail. Every attempt to land ground troops on Taiwan's beaches is met with missile strikes and fierce beach combat. Yes, he's slowly whittling away at those defenses, but for each victory he achieves, a road is destroyed or a tunnel collapsed by Taiwan, forcing his troops to divert over difficult terrain to get to Taipei. The few who managed to reach Taiwan's capital have been destroyed in urban warfare. This was supposed to be a quick victory. It had to be. Every day that China doesn't control Taiwan is another day in which American counter-offensives draw nearer. Finally, two weeks after his missile launches, Xi faces the prospect of American naval and aerial assets reaching the Taiwan Strait. Worse yet, they're supported by NATO and Japan, neither of which wants to see China gain more influence, be it in the Pacific or the Americas. Worse yet for China, its navy, though larger than America's, doesn't compare in terms of sheer firepower. Though Xi was successful in destroying almost two dozen of America's destroyers in his missile barrage, that still leaves 68 to contend with, around 20 more than China has. And although China has more corvettes and patrol boats, neither will withstand the combined naval firepower being brought into the Taiwan Strait. Worse yet for Xi, America has an ace in the hole. It's rapid dragon tactic. Over the past couple of years, the United States has been retrofitting some of its cargo aircraft so they're capable of dropping pallets of long-range missiles. Each pallet can be stocked up with 30 AGM-158 JASM cruise missiles, which have a range of between 229 and 1,118 miles, depending on which version of the missile is launched. Stacked into America's MC-130J aircraft, which Xi didn't target as he didn't believe them to be a threat, these pallets start raining cruise missiles down onto the Taiwan Strait. Those missiles serve two purposes. If they hit a Chinese ship, their 990-pound WDU-42B penetrator warheads can easily destroy most targets. But even if they fail to hit, such a large barrage of missiles launched simultaneously will confuse the missile defense systems built into China's larger warships, as well as those in the three air bases that are the launching point for China's fighter jets. While the missile defenses are focused on a flurry of JASM cruise missiles, more targeted strikes can take out targets. The Allied forces turn the tide in the Taiwan Strait. Month 2 Xi has lost the clear passage into Taiwan that he'd established during his initial invasion. He's still getting troops onto the mainland, though each landing is subjected to Taiwanese defenses along with assaults from the US and its allies' navies. Worse yet, he's lost air superiority. In truth, he never really had it. Taiwan's 142 F-16 fighter jets, many of which have been upgraded, may be technologically inferior to China's J-20s. The infrared search and track, or IRST, built into the J-20s means that it's far more capable of tracking and eliminating a target than the F-16. But Tsai knew this, and knew that support was coming from the US. She's used her F-16s to delay rather than defeat China just as she's used her beach and urban warfare tactics to keep China from sending hundreds of thousands of troops into Taipei. Now, the US and NATO are in the Taiwan Strait, and they're pushing Chinese forces back to their home country. Constant missile barrages on the Longqian, Jiangsu, and Huan airbases have rendered them practically unusable, making it a struggle for China to get new fighters into the air as quickly as it had managed before. America's aircraft carriers, of which it brings eight to the Taiwan Strait, can each hold around 75 fighters, 
bringing the Allied forces to a total of 600 when at full capacity. Add to that the rapid Dragon strategy, and America and its allies are shutting down every attack China attempts. It's not long before America's navy cuts off the passage into Taiwan. Cut off from their target, China's naval and air forces begin a retreat, leaving the few thousand Chinese troops still in Taiwan stranded. They'll be picked off by Taiwan's forces in Taipei, assuming they get there. And with the US now firmly entrenched in the Taiwan Strait, it's able to land troops on the island's beaches to attack the remnants of China's forces from the rear. It's a lethal pincer movement that soon puts paid to Xi's invasion. Still, it hasn't all been clear sailing for the US. China has managed to use its strong submarine fleet, with its six Shang-class nuclear submarines leading the way, to take out two of America's aircraft carriers. It's a difficult loss, especially given that those carriers housed about 150 fighters between them. But America's submarines are just as lethal. Though it has fewer submarines than China, around 60 to China's 78, its crews are better trained and have fewer targets to strike. Both of China's aircraft carriers, brought into the conflict due to the American assaults on its air bases, are taken out, minimizing China's impact from the air. Xi has to face a very real possibility. He's about to lose this war. Month 3. China has stubbornly refused to give in to the overwhelming force being applied to it. The country's navy lies in tatters, with only a fleet of patrol boats guarding its coast to back the few corvettes and frigates it has left. Xi has called his ships back, anticipating an invasion by the United States into the Chinese mainland. Xi has failed to take Taiwan. And in attacking the United States directly, he's only discovered that America's NATO allies take Article 5 very seriously. The same goes for other allies, including Japan and South Korea, which have aided the US both because of their military alliances with the country and because neither wants to see the spread of Chinese influence in the Indo-Pacific. Xi knows he's miscalculated. Now he faces a very big question. Does he launch nuclear weapons? China has around 500 nukes, as well as ICBMs, capable of reaching the continental United States. His country's CSS-4 Mod-2 Mod-3 missiles could do the job thanks to their 8,000-mile range. The DF-41 can also hit the mark, as it's capable of traveling nearly 7,500 miles. But Xi thinks better of it. Launching his nuclear weapons against the United States would mean a response in kind. And while America's Minuteman III ICBMs lack the range of his missiles, the country's submarines and aerial bombers could easily drop nukes all over China if provoked. Ultimately, China is forced to capitulate. Though its military would prove a strong match for the United States alone, and could even have the potential to defeat its American counterpart, it simply can't stand up to such a powerful united front. Taiwan proved stronger than Xi expected, with his failed invasion meaning plans to reach the American mainland never got off the ground. And with most of Europe, thanks to NATO, gunning for him, he can't escape the fact that he's been overwhelmed. Add to all of this the effects of the sanctions and trade blockades America created within days of him starting his war. They've slowly sapped the morale of the Chinese people, resulting in them being ready for surrender. America wins the war, but it's a win that came at a cost. It will take the US years to rebuild its war-torn navy, and along with its NATO allies, it will be heavily involved in imposing military restrictions on China for years to come. However, it's proven the impact that its cooperative approach to defense can have in a battle against one of its greatest rivals, putting any other major military power that might dare to attack the US on notice in the process. Of course, this is just one of many potential scenarios that could play out if China and the US went to war. It's also optimistic in favor of the US. But what could China do to prevent this series of events from happening? Would they happen at all, or do you think the US may struggle to receive the support it needs from NATO and its allies in Asia? Tell us what you think in the comments below. Now go and check out the US Navy's plan to defeat China in war, or click this other video instead. Kidnapping nuclear power plant officials, forcing Ukrainian staff to work at gunpoint, secretly placing explosives inside the plant, and possibly creating a nuclear catastrophe, only a complete maniac would resort to such extreme measures with potentially apocalyptic consequences in order to win a war. And we're pretty sure you know who we're talking about. In recent weeks, the war in Ukraine has taken yet another frightening turn, one which shows just how desperate Putin has gotten. The newest developments are based around the Zaporizhia power plant, Located in Ukraine's southeast on the bank of the Dnipro River, 
Zaporizhia is the largest nuclear power plant in Europe and has become a serious concern since Russia's invasion commenced. In early March of last year, Russian troops stormed and took control of the plant, where they kidnapped two top Ukrainian energy company officials. Despite the Russian occupation, the plant has continued to be run by Ukrainian staff, forced to work at gunpoint. It has also suffered numerous dangerous power outages and even taken damage from shelling by Russian forces. But now things at Zaporizhia have become even more dire especially after the destruction of the nearby Kokovka Dam, which independent investigations have linked to Russia. In recent days, Ukrainian officials have warned that Putin plans to do the same thing to the power plant, using explosive charges laid somewhere inside and potentially creating a nuclear disaster. But just how credible are these threats by Putin's regime? And if Zaporizhia is sabotaged, what will it mean for Ukraine, Russia and the future of the war? Before diving into these questions, let's take a quick look at the dramatic history of the plant. The city of Zaporizhia, which sits about 60 miles north of the power plant, was originally founded in 1770 to protect the southern territories of the Russian Empire from invasion by the Crimean Tatars. But as Russia expanded, the city lost its strategic significance and became a small rural town until the start of the 20th century. But following the Russian Revolution, Zaporizhia quickly industrialized. As the Soviets built the Dnipro hydroelectric station, the Zaporizhia steel plant and the Dnipro aluminium plant, the city also came to play a key role in World War II, becoming the scene of intense fighting between the USSR and Nazi Germany, as well as a temporary Nazi headquarters. To stop German advances, the Red Army eventually blew an enormous hole in the nearby Dnipro hydroelectric dam in 1941, producing a flood wave that swept from Zaporizhia to nearby Nikopol. The flood killed local residents as well as soldiers from both armies, with historians estimating the death toll to be between 20,000 and 100,000. When the war ended, the city and its surrounding industries were eventually returned to Soviet control, setting up the plant's modern significance. The Zaporizhia nuclear power plant was constructed throughout the 1980s. It has six VVER-1000 style pressurized light water nuclear reactors, each fueled with enriched uranium-235. The first five were successfully brought online between 1985 and 1989, while the sixth was added several years later. When Ukraine declared independence from the Soviet Union in 1991, the power plant became the property of the new country. It operated smoothly during the early 21st century, but became a place of concern following Russia's 2014 annexation of Crimea and aggression in the Donbass region. Shelling soon took place very close to the plant, and its operations were interrupted several times leading to rolling blackouts across the region. Even today, Ukraine gets about half of its electricity from 15 nuclear reactors at four plants across the country, according to the World Nuclear Association. Zaporizhia alone provided almost half of Ukraine's nuclear power, until the service disruptions began as a result of Russia's invasion. And while shelling has repeatedly damaged the plant since the full-scale invasion began last year, so far it has not resulted in a nuclear disaster. But that could change very quickly. Warnings by Ukrainian and international officials have become more dire since Russia allegedly blew up the nearby Kokovka Dam and hydroelectric power plant on June 6, with many claiming the same could be done at Zaporizhia. The nuclear plant also relies on water from the reservoir to provide power for its turbine condensers, according to the International Atomic Energy Agency. Things escalated further in early July as Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky claimed that Ukrainian intelligence had information that Russian troops have placed explosives on the roof of the Zaporizhia plant. This set off alarm bells around the world. Since the last nuclear incident to take place on Ukrainian soil, the infamous 1986 Chernobyl disaster, is widely regarded as the worst in history. But even at Chernobyl, the nuclear disaster was accidental. There has never before been a case of an invading country weaponizing a nuclear power plant and using it as a hostage threat in the way Putin has been doing with Zaporizhia. Nor has there ever been such a large nuclear plant so squarely in the middle of a war zone, which has complicated efforts to safeguard the reactors. Luckily, after the explosion at the Kokovka Dam, the last of Zaporizhia's six reactors was put into cold shutdown. In this state, all control rods are inserted into the reactor core to stop the nuclear fission reaction and generation of heat and pressure. This greatly reduced the chances of a nuclear meltdown on the scale of Chernobyl, even if things around the plant are far from safe. William Albuck, the Director of Strategy, Technology and Arms Control at the International Institute for Strategic Studies, 
has said that we're actually very, very lucky. Any incident would not involve an active reactor, which could cause enormous environmental danger and damage and deaths. At the same time, Alberk also said the warnings from Ukrainian officials should be taken very seriously, since any time Ukraine and the US think that a false flag attack is going to happen, they talk about it early, often and loudly. And this is, I think, an attempt to deter Russia from doing something that they're concerned may happen. So why would Putin do something as seemingly insane as blowing up a nuclear power plant? Most likely as a sort of very scary deterrent for the West. Damage to Europe's largest nuclear power plant is just the sort of incident that would scare the hell out of the international coalition supporting Ukraine. And it would show that Putin is serious, without resorting to the use of an actual nuclear weapon, sending fallout back towards Moscow. And the fact that he is seemingly willing to engage in such a desperate high-stakes gamble shows just how badly the invasion has gone. With the short-lived rebellion of the Wagner Group PMC earlier in July, Putin is facing serious questions from even his most hardcore supporters. An explosion at Zaporizhia could easily be turned into a false flag, with Putin blaming Ukraine and claiming that as justification to continue the war effort. There are also huge economic stakes surrounding the plant's control and operations. Each of Zaporizhia's reactors would cost $7 billion to replace. These enormous sums means Russia likely doesn't want to actually destroy any of the reactors. Instead, Putin probably hopes to use the plant later to serve Russia's own electricity market, according to analysis by defense and security intelligence firm Jane's. Should Russia keep control of the plant, Ukraine would lose up to 20% of its domestic electricity generating capacity. This also makes its future operations a huge strategic bargaining chip, one which would come into play later this year. And according to Al Burk, there are four possible ways Russia could be planning to attack the plant. They could blow up the dry fuel storage, blow up the wet fuel storage, blow up one of the reactor buildings itself, or try to melt the nuclear fuel that's still in the reactor. Each of these could play out slightly differently. If Russia strikes the plant from outside and claims that Ukraine did it, they will be striking the heavily reinforced four-foot-thick concrete walls. Unlike the Chernobyl-style RBMK reactors, Zaporizhia is much more solid, and it would require a huge amount of weaponry to break through the outside of a building. Even so, none of the possibilities are very good. The least dangerous of the four scenarios would be blowing up the dry fuel storage. The main impact of this type of attack would be on people in the direct downwind, who would have an increased risk of cancer in their lifetime. Even without a true Chernobyl-style disaster, this could potentially affect tens of thousands and would be very difficult to counteract in the middle of an open war zone. Other possibilities are even more unpleasant to consider. The most dangerous scenario would be to blow up the reactor vessel inside the building itself. This would be similar to what Russia did when it blew up the Kokovka Dam. While it would not involve opening a live reactor, like occurred at Chernobyl, it would still involve burning nuclear fuel, which could potentially melt through the floor, as happened in Japan in 2011. Because the reactors are in cold shutdown, the risk of a true catastrophe is greatly reduced. As Alberk pointed out, None of these scenarios rise to the level of a Fukushima or Chernobyl unless they blow it up right from the inside and they guard it to make sure that no one can do anything about it for a couple of weeks and the fuel builds up and then explodes. With the International Atomic Energy Agency IAEA on site, this is pretty unlikely. Alberg said that the IAEA is monitoring the reactors very closely, so it would be hard to plan such an explosion from inside without IAEA's team seeing it. But that might not stop Putin. Ukrainian intelligence and satellite imagery have confirmed the presence of multiple unknown objects on the top of the building, which may or may not be explosives. The IAEA also can't be totally sure about any of this, as their team has requested access to the roof of the building and other at-risk areas, but has so far been unable to verify either way. Let's say Putin actually pulls off an explosion at Zaporizhia. How much damage could it do to Ukraine? According to some experts, while it would certainly be bad, the effects of an explosion would also be limited. The immediate death toll of such an event would probably be lower than the floods unleashed by the Kokovka Dam, which killed over 100 people and left close to a million without clean drinking water. Similarly, the environmental impact of an explosion at Zaporizhia would not be as severe as that of the flooding, which ruined local ecosystems, killed more than 20,000 domesticated animals and ruined hundreds of acres of Ukrainian farmland. Overall, the flood caused an estimated $1.3 billion worth of damage. 
The American Nuclear Society has published similar findings saying that the reactors being shut down has greatly limited the risk of fallout from an explosion. They determined that in the worst-case scenario, it is unlikely that there would be enough radiation released to threaten public safety, even in the case of deliberate sabotage of the reactors and spent fuel storage canisters. In the event that the massive concrete structures could even be breached, the reactor shutdowns would limit radiation damage to the area surrounding the plant. While this is clearly good news for the European public, it's not much reassurance to the Ukrainians with homes nearby the plant. Alberk and others have admitted that anyone living within 20 miles of the reactor would still be at risk. And there is also disagreement among experts as to the wider risk from a damaged plant. Nuclear physicist Ed Lyman recently wrote that the American Nuclear Society was dead wrong about the level of risk. He has argued that the reactor shutdown just means operators will have more time to respond to a potential incident. Hopefully that means they can fix any damage before the cooling water in the reactor cores boils away, exposing the fuel assemblies and causing them to overheat. Lyman also notes that even in shutdown mode, there are still a range of things that could go wrong inside the reactor, such as a reduction in the levels of boron in the cooling water, creating short-lived but still toxic fission products, such as iodine isotopes. It's also extremely rare for reactors to be maintained long-term in either hot or cold shutdown modes, with fuel still remaining in the core. Because it happens so rarely, there is limited data and an increased risk of malfunction. As he ominously puts it, Unfortunately, because of the incredible stress that the greatly reduced staff at Zaporizhia are under and the unclear lines of command under Russian occupation, their ability to efficiently execute all the actions necessary to mitigate any accident or sabotage attack is in grave doubt. Essentially, even with all six reactors in cold shutdown, there's a whole lot of things that could go wrong. All of this casts some doubt on the idea of limited fallout, especially if the war drags on for an extended period of time with the plant's status remaining uncertain. These possibilities are still concerning enough, the Ukrainian authorities recently conducted emergency drills nearby. The city of Zaporizhia is about 62 miles north of the power plant, far enough to limit instant exposure, but still far too close for comfort. So at the end of June 2023, hundreds of Ukrainian emergency workers put on hazmat suits and got to work. They scoured the city and nearby villages with radiation detectors, and have been passing out iodine tablets to residents for months. During the recent drills, they also set up a tent to provide first aid, with emergency workers practicing hosing people down with soap and going through the fake process of administering treatment to individuals who play-acted victims from possible radiation-affected areas. This type of contingency planning shows real concerns, especially since the procedures for containment would be far more difficult in an active combat zone. Should something happen at the plant, the people will be brought from radiation-contaminated areas to a location upwind, where they will be given medical and psychological assistance. The next stop would be a temporary holding center, where people would be washed to wipe away surface radiation and then transported to evacuation points and hospitals. According to the emergency services, in case of a nuclear disaster at the plant, approximately 300,000 people would need to be evacuated from the areas closest to the facility. That covers four regions – Dnipropetrovsk, Kherson, Zaporizhia and Mikolaev. The evacuation would be mandatory and require massive logistics coordination. According to the Ukrainian government, people will be allowed to bring their pets with them while buses, trains and personal cars would be used for the evacuation from the affected zone. Residents in the area have also been preparing for any possibility. Local Larissa Mikolaeva told ABC that we need to prepare for the worst and hope for the best. She added that while the drill made her anxious, she understands why it's being done. Her family, like many others, has already stocked up on large bottles of drinking water, stored food supplies, and purchased masks to prepare for possible disaster. In the nearby areas controlled by Russia, similar preparations have been undertaken in the last few weeks. Russian installed government officials said they had evacuated 1,600 people, including 660 children, from the area directly around the plant. There are also potential issues of who could or would get civilians to safety and clean up the damage from an explosion. Zaporizhia sits very close to the front line, one which could change quickly depending on the success of Ukraine's counteroffensive. Because of this, the ownership and control over the plant is likely to remain disputed in the short term, and it's unclear how or if Ukrainian and Russian occupation authorities would coordinate a disaster response. According to the United Nations, nuclear safety is the responsibility of every nation that utilizes nuclear technology, but there is no rulebook for nuclear safety in a war zone. Since its occupation of the plant began in March last year, Russia has designated it federal property, 
creating a state-run company to oversee its operation, and given it a pathetically small 500,000 rubles for funding, the equivalent of $6,500. But despite these actions, the plant and territory legally belongs to Ukraine, a position supported by both international law and most countries in the world. So far, this situation has led to the IAEA acting as a de facto mediator between the two countries, while attempting to ensure that the plant itself does not suffer damage. But if Putin decides to act on his plan to damage Zaporizhia with explosives, this uneasy status quo could change in an instant. At that point, it's anyone's guess whether Russia, Ukraine or both would attempt to maintain control of the plant and secure the nearby population. So what does the current situation at Zaporizhia mean for the future of the war? For one thing, it's a pretty clear sign that Putin will not stop playing the politics of fear. By setting up the possibility of a false flag attack, he has essentially admitted that regular military strategy is failing him. Considering how relatively close the plant is to Moscow, it seems as though he is somewhat confident that the fallout would be limited, or only irradiate areas inside Ukraine. The natural conclusion is that he is not going for damage but instead for sheer terror, to try and regain his footing in a losing conflict. Perhaps he hopes that the threat of extreme measures will get Russian hardliners behind him once again, or that fear of nuclear fallout will cause the West to question its support for Ukraine. Whatever his desired outcome here, it's yet another display of a callous leader, one more like a mafia thug than the president of a great power. This also raises a final question. How should the international community go about dealing with Zaporizhia? Experts have come up with a number of strategies, mostly involving neutral peacekeepers who can oversee the plant's operations and ensure that it isn't used as a nuclear bargaining chip again. The most probable option for this is a demilitarized zone around the plant, but this would involve some sort of agreement between Ukraine and Russia, which doesn't look very likely in the near future. Any outcome will also depend heavily on the success or failure of Ukraine's ongoing counteroffensive, since it will determine who ultimately has control of the plant's day-to-day -day operations. Given the enormous amount of energy it has provided to Ukraine in the past, the government in Kyiv will almost certainly try to retake and keep control of the plant. As always, it's very hard to know what the future will bring, but one way or another, Zaporizhia is likely to be a major part of the war's second year. But what do you think? Will Putin really set off explosives at the nuclear power plant, or is he just bluffing? And if not, what does this mean for the future of the war? Let us know in the comment section below and don't forget to subscribe for more military content and analysis. This is the biggest country on planet Earth, with a total area of 6,601,665 square miles and a land area of 6,322,142 square miles. It represents 11% of the total world's landmass and is 1.8 times larger than America. But Russia isn't just a big country, it's a big problem and if it collapses as a result of the consequences of the war in Ukraine, this will impact everybody, everywhere. Yes, even you. But why? And in what way? Let's find out. Send in the tanks, uh, if you can find any. Russia has always prided itself on its Victory Day celebration. Held to commemorate the Soviet victory over the Nazis in World War II, the bombastic parade held annually in Red Square has historically served as a visual barometer of Russian military power. It is common to see rows upon rows of marching soldiers, jets, tanks, armored vehicles, and intercontinental ballistic missiles file past an absorbed crowd and its approving leadership. This year, things were a little different. The Kremlin scaled things back, like, a lot. There was no flyover, there were no Iskanders, there were 3,000 fewer soldiers, most of them cadets and students at local military universities. And rather than a steady stream of T-90Ms, T-14 Armatas, a solitary World War II vintage T-34 tank motored past the reviewing stand. For how staggering Russian tank losses have been in the Ukraine thus far, it's tempting to think this T-34 is actually the bottom of the barrel for Putin's forces. After all, Having lost 192 tanks in the First Chechen War, 23 tanks in the Second Chechen War, and 3 tanks in the Russo-Georgian War, Russia has now lost an impressive 1,937 tanks in Ukraine thus far as of May 2023. And that is just how many have been visually confirmed. Just let that sink in. There are more tanks yet in Russia's arsenal, but most of them are currently employed in Ukraine, along with the lion's share of its military forces explaining the humbler military parade presence than years past. 
Factor in the recent drone scare over the Kremlin, and we can see that this year's parade was held despite legitimate strategic red flags and security concerns unfathomable just one year ago. Some say the event, designed to capture the public's imagination and promote the heady militaristic nationalism of the Soviet glory days, is merely papering over the cracks in Russia's armed forces. Of these, there are many. The irony is that the last time the Russian military orchestrated a military victory of any consequence was exactly 78 years ago during World War II. Today, its operations in Ukraine are on track to follow a more common Russian pattern of strategic overstretch and ignominious withdrawal. There are increasing warning signs that the weaknesses we are seeing are evidence of far graver threats to Putin's regime. Recently, Yevgeny Prigozhin, chief of the Wagner mercenary group fighting around Bakhmut in Ukraine, criticized the Kremlin for not sending enough ammunition to make a difference on the front lines. Victory Day is the victory of our grandfathers, he vented on social media. We haven't earned that victory one millimeter. It should surprise no one that victory now looks far from attainable. On the contrary, in the light of economic sanctions and the declining financial health of the Russian Federation, some are predicting far worse for Putin's forces and his political future. With less to be positive about now than at any point in the war, could Putin's regime actually be on the brink of collapse? And what might that look like? In a recent survey of 167 foreign policy experts held by the Atlantic Council, 46% of them believed that the collapse or disintegration of Russia could happen in the next 10 years. 40% claimed that this would happen internally for a number of reasons, particularly because of a revolution, civil war, or political disintegration. We all know that wars gone awry can exacerbate and expedite the deterioration of a society faster than just about anything else. But Putin's abysmal strategic direction of Russia's war in Ukraine could have the country on the fast track to obscurity, oblivion, or far, far worse, outright dissolution. There are two prime historical touchpoints in modern history we tend to reference when we talk about a Russian political collapse, which is really saying something if you think about it. The first is the most recent, when the Soviet Union broke apart at the end of the Cold War. In case you're too young to remember, this collapse caught the world by surprise. Many were shocked to see a country so large and powerful, on paper at least, suddenly and rapidly fall apart. Some blame Russia's current state of affairs on the West's response to that significant geopolitical moment. Heralded as the start of a new era of freedom, liberation and self-determination, many worried the independence of a host of ex-Soviet satellites and the weakening of Russia would destabilize the international order. Since the 1990s, all of the Soviet Union's 21 constituent republics declared themselves sovereign. Putin, a staunch imperialist who pines for the good old days, took this pretty hard. After he rose to power, the West tried to maintain dialogue and positive relations with the Kremlin, even as it embarked on a repressive imperialist foreign policy with deployments in the Second Chechen War, the 2008 invasion of Georgia, and the 2014 invasion of Ukraine. Since the end of the Cold War, Putin has created a regime that actively restricts the rights of the dozens of different national and ethnic groups within the boundaries of the modern Russian state. He wants to be a czar, with a wheel of dependent satellites to exploit for natural resources, manpower, and money. Russian officials and Kremlin propagandists have made it their goal to promote this agenda, making the ruthless look benign. Someday, who is to say Moldova, Kazakhstan, or other Central Asian nations might not come under the tighter thumb of Russian imperial aggression. What would it mean for European security? That's why Ukraine matters. The war there poses serious problems for Putin's imperial ambitions. He and his cabinet thought it would be a short war, one that would permanently bring Ukraine back into Russia's orbit. Instead, he is suffering one of the most catastrophic military setbacks of the past hundred years one that has already surpassed the devastation caused by the Russo-Japanese War of 1905, and one approaching the scale with the type of suffering that preceded the other major Russian collapse, the collapse of the Tsarist Empire in 1917. That, in case you forgot, was the first time the Russian Federation dissolved, the event that triggered Russia's chaotic, bloody descent into Soviet-era communism. And let me tell you, it was a whirlwind of a time to be alive. One moment you are a Russian soldier, fighting Germany and Austria-Hungary with the Entente Allies on the Eastern Front. The next, you learn the inefficient and widely corrupt Tsarist government can no longer sustain the economic and material costs of the war effort. Before you know it, 
tens of thousands of soldiers, workers and peasants are fed up, rising up, overthrowing the imperial government and installing the Bolsheviks in power. Countless Russian minorities yearned in those turbulent times for some form of recognition and freedom, which had been elusive under the Tsars. When the empire disintegrated and crashed out of the war, social, economic and socio-political ruptures terminated the central control of the state and enabled the temporary formation of a series of new polities, including the Siberian Republic and other former territories that got their first taste of independence. These include Finland, Poland, Latvia, Lithuania and Estonia. It wouldn't be long before the Soviets, consolidating state power once more under the communist flag of the USSR, gobbled them back up. And you wonder why they were more than happy to join NATO in the aftermath of the Cold War. Most experts believe that a modern Russian collapse will be swifter, more brutal, and more akin to the revolutionary crisis of 1917 than the Soviet collapse of 1991. It is a possible scenario. The conditions in Russia today do bear a passing resemblance to those within the Tsarist Empire at the time of its fall. A deeply corrupt and morally bankrupt ruling class led by oligarchs, aristocrats, and elites with no conception of the economic suffering of the masses. Ethnic minorities in places like Dagestan, Ichkeria, Igushetia, Ossetia, Kabardino, the Caucasus, Tuva, Buryatia, and others inhumanely treated, discriminated against, and used as cannon fodder in Putin's wars. A population in serious demographic decline, growing mistrust of Russian institutions and governance, intensive state oppression, a country that will owe billions, if not trillions of dollars, to rebuild Ukraine when the time comes. If you think any singular cause will cause Putin's downfall, you'd be wrong. History is non-linear, multi-causal and contingent. Yanis Bagashki, author of Failed State, A Guide to Russia's Rupture, put it best. The demise of the current Russian Federation is unlikely to follow a single path, unlike that of the Soviet Union where 15 Union republics became independent states almost by default. The fracturing of the state is likely to be chaotic, prolonged, sequential, conflictive and increasingly violent. It can result in the full separation of some federal units and the amalgamation of others into new federal or confederal arrangements. Bruno Tertrace, an advisor for geopolitics at the Institute Montaigne, has argued that the only good thing about a Russian collapse today is that the nuclear issue would be far less serious than it was with the Soviet Union. Elites would be far more interested in preserving some semblance of authority and power rather than commit political and personal suicide by launching a nuclear attack. Most of Russia's nuclear forces today are inside the Federation, not beyond its borders like during the Cold War, when it had 7,000 nukes stationed outside Russia. Exploring the implications for Russia's future as a nuclear power if trends continue the way they are, Bruno observed, in the 1970s the Soviet Union was described as upper Volta with rockets, he said. By the 2000s it was Mexico with nuclear weapons. In 2010s, a gas station with nuclear weapons. Will it become a Somalia with nuclear weapons? So how exactly might Russia collapse? What would it mean for its neighbors? We know that a country's foreign policy is a reflection of its domestic situation, and vice versa. In Russia's case, Putin's actions have the country on the path to economic Armageddon. The price of Russian crude oil is the lowest it's been in years. Within the first two months of 2023, the state had already fallen into a deficit level normally achieved in an entire year. It isn't profiting much from its sale of hydrocarbons to India and China. Its import sales are collapsing. Its GDP has shrunk by 4%. Air cargo fell by 60% in 2022. There has been a massive loss of technical expertise and specialized equipment as foreign corporations and businesses fled the country. It lacks vital semiconductors and other specialized machinery imported from the West, meaning its entire economy, to say nothing of its military power, is becoming more and more primitive. The net result is an increasing reliance on states like China for resources and technology, systems that can be integrated but take time. While that happens, poverty will spread, it will be harder to receive good health care, and the population will grow more discontent with the government. These factors could affect the strength of existing national movements or ethnic minorities within the Russian Federation seeking greater independence and autonomy. Moscow is far removed from many of these population centers and has, until now, relied on a technocratic system of oligarchical control 
where Kremlin-appointed elites receive massive checks to keep their provinces in line. These leaders, in turn, return the regional profits to the Kremlin's coffers. Russian elites are deeply dependent on Moscow's political and economic authority for their own legitimacy. When this goes bankrupt, what happens? When the public loses faith in these Kremlin-appointed governors and the Kremlin can no longer provide them with the support they need to maintain order, there's a chance that local separatist movements will grow. In resource and industrial-rich regions, there might be the temptation to cut ties with Moscow and go it alone with the support of the people. This happened in 2020, when mass protests erupted in eastern Khabarovsk after the arrest and 22-year imprisonment of Sergei Fergal, a member of the opposition party. This caused a power vacuum that Moscow had to fill. But it needs resources and support to do so. And with the war dragging on and the bite of sanctions becoming more and more acute, it is increasingly likely that Putin will struggle to plug the holes in the dike as the flood of discontent spreads. Unlike the Soviet Union, whose power rested on the Comintern and whose governing authority always had a reasonably clear line of succession, nobody knows what will happen in Putin's vertical, highly centralized hierarchy if the figurehead falls. Will there be a civil war? Will a power struggle ensue between Putin's elites? Will Moscow, already neck deep in its military invasion of Ukraine, have the resources to suppress any separatist movements that arise? Back in 1917, this was the avenue that led to the downfall of the Tsarist Empire. Like falling dominoes, the Ukrainian Central Rada presented its first universal declaration. Five months later, it declared the creation of the Ukrainian People's Republic. Other regions did the same. By the time you get to 1918, the Red Army was forced to suppress these movements and bring them into submission. Only Poland, Finland, Latvia, Estonia and Lithuania States with active support from the United States, Great Britain and France, the victors of World War I, managed to secure their independence, if only for a time. The Bolsheviks managed to set the ship straight, but it came at a massive cost. Putin has to hope his cronies are as committed as the Bolsheviks were when his grasp on power is brought into question. So far, one of his tactics has been to feature minority participants in the Ukraine occupation like Kadyrov's Chechens in his propaganda campaign for two purposes – to both show Federation solidarity in the war and, if things go sour, to have a scapegoat for the Russian army's broader operational failures. If Russia collapsed, it would probably start with a breakaway movement in one territory that spreads like a virus to others on the country's periphery. Chechnya, for example, could be the first domino to fall. They have a history of enmity with the Kremlin, after all, and a recent one at that. Local elites like Kadyrov will be posturing for greater political power if they start to glimpse fractures in Putin's existing political system. Already struggling to deal with Ukraine, how might Russia deal with discontented Chechen and Wagner mercenaries who, more loyal to the cult of their own determined rulers than they are to Russia itself, come marching back to Moscow? Could these leaders, fueled by vengeful hatred for the way they were left to die on the battlefields of Ukraine with too few weapons, shells and dilapidated equipment, form a Faustian pact and team up against Putin? Or will battlefield defeat and economic poverty force these sides into internecine warfare amongst themselves, a battle royale for ultimate political power? Okay, it might be a stretch, and we should temper our prognosis just a little. While it's tempting to look at online maps depicting the collapse of Russia by 2025, with fantastical graphics carving the country up into dozens of independent republics, the reality is that Russia's internal divisions are far less stark than they appear. According to Alexei Gusev, a fellow at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, the maps betray a delusion on the part of their authors that is common to many political forecasters. These observers, all map fetishists, mistake the administrative boundaries of Russia's provinces for real borders of socio-economic life, unaware that the true divisions in Russian society almost never coincide with the arbitrary lines drawn by Communist Party functionaries in the first half of the last century. Russia is extremely unlikely to disintegrate along its regional borders for geographical, sociological, economical and political administrative reasons. Sociologically, Gusev argues, most of Russia's regions share the same basic values and attitudes. For those praying for Putin's downfall, just know this. Russia always ends up rebuilding itself. Preferentially, a new, more egalitarian form of governance would emerge from the ashes. Historically, hardship, defeat and political turmoil have been the breadbasket of totalitarianism. 
As long as Putin remains in power, it is unlikely that Russia's collapse will resemble the peaceful disintegration of 1991. Putin looks set to run, in air quotes, naturally for president again in 2024. He'll be familiar with essays by the likes of Ival Ilyin, who wrote in 1950 what dismemberment of Russia entails for the world. He knows that battlefield victories will all but seal his grip on power for decades to come. But with a hard year of campaigning ahead, one in which Ukraine will slowly integrate new Western weapon systems into its counteroffensive strategy, Putin will be forced to drain Russian resources further, sending young men to die on the front lines. Hatred will grow. Putin will be forced to suppress these feelings to prevent widespread discontent. This begins a vicious cycle in which the only thing that can save his dictatorship is more suppression, which leads to more discontent. And you see where this is going. Edward Lucas, senior advisor and senior fellow at the Center for European Policy Analysis, put it best. As the butcher's bill mounts in Ukraine, the war story contains only stale bombast. The lie machine insists that black is white. The result is cognitive dissonance between what Russians experience in their daily lives and what the state propaganda machine is telling them. As we know from Soviet times, that can last for a long time, but not indefinitely. The whiff of change is in the air. The truth, more than anything, is that the cracks in the Russian power pyramid have been present since Putin came to power. His actions over the past year have only accelerated a process of decline already long in motion. It is fighting an unwinnable war. If it refuses to pull out of Ukraine and rebuild its military, it will soon be unable to prevent those who want to leave the Federation from doing so. If the oligarchs turn on Putin, Will there be a struggle between intelligence services, the National Guard, and foreign mercenaries? Will Putin be assassinated? Russia has committed several grave geopolitical blunders throughout the past hundred years. Could this be their worst? Could Putin survive politically or physically a military defeat? Let us know in the comments. These days, Xi Jinping and Putin seem to be nothing short of BFFs. But the reality of the relationship between China and Russia is far more dramatic and complex. After decades of dispute over borders and the proper role of communism in society, China and post-Soviet Russia have now forged the closest relationship in their history. The two countries often participate in military drills, share sensitive technology, and have agreed to work together to undermine the US dollar as the world's reserve currency, and have even flirted with plans to build a joint moon base. Chinese purchases of Russian energy have been critical for the latter's economic survival in the wake of international sanctions following its invasion of Ukraine. But Russia's lack of success in its war has also revealed some of the weaknesses in this strategic partnership that is supposedly without limit. China has not given Russia direct military aid, something that the Kremlin has badly wanted. It is willing to give Russia certain parts that it needs for weapons, but will currently not go beyond that. This decision by Xi Jinping is ostensibly to avoid damaging China's already slowing economy with international sanctions that would follow such a move. But what if there was a more cynical principle involved too? What if it wouldn't be all that bad for China if its now undeniably junior strategic partner were to lose the war in Ukraine? Let's look at some of the reasons why Beijing might not be all too upset about a Russian defeat. China and Russia have a shared interest in undermining the post-Cold War international order led by the United States. However, beyond this, there are some tensions within the strategic partnership. Moscow and Beijing have long had border disputes that have at times turned deadly. Border skirmishes broke out in 1969, for example. Although the border dispute was supposedly settled in a 2005 agreement, there are still some tensions. On Valentine's Day 2023, the Chinese Ministry of Natural Resources issued a mandate that eight cities in Outer or Russian Manchuria, including Vladivostok, should be known by their original Chinese names on future government maps. In Chinese government documents, Russian Vladivostok will now be known as Haishenwai. This move may have been in response to a 2020 message by the Russian embassy to China on Weibo, the Chinese equivalent to X, formerly Twitter, about the 160th anniversary of the founding of Vladivostok. However, Vladivostok had once been Chinese territory and was acknowledged as such by the 1689 Treaty of Nechinsk between Tsarist Russia and the Qing dynasty. Then, during China's weakness in the 19th century, the former forced the latter to sign two treaties that granted Vladivostok and the rest of Outer Manchuria to Russia. The 2005 border agreement acknowledged the 19th century borderlines. 
Up until now, Beijing had an interest in abiding by those borderlines no matter how historically resentful it was to the Chinese leadership. But a Russian defeat in Ukraine would give China more leverage to reassert those old territorial claims and insist on restoring the old 1689 border, especially if the Russian military were to be completely depleted. Reclaiming these lost territories would be beneficial to Beijing in other ways too. For example, if China could retake the southern part of the Khabarovsk Krai in Outer Manchuria, its border would reach the Sea of Japan and the Sea of Okhotsk. Geostrategically, this acquisition would help to mitigate China's being surrounded by the First Island Chain, a set of countries friendly to the United States that stretches from Japan to Indonesia. The First Island Chain creates several choke points that permit the United States and its allies to cut off Chinese shipping, such as the Malacca, Luzon, and Miyako Straits. About 60% of China's energy imports come through these shipping lanes, and if hostilities were to break out over Taiwan, let's say, a blockade by the United States and its allies would destroy the Chinese economy. Securing Outer Manchuria would permit China to seek alternative shipping lanes to the north. Outer Manchuria also has abundant resources. Plentiful hydrocarbon reserves are there, and since China is a country heavily dependent on foreign energy imports, it would naturally desire to produce as many domestic sources as possible. The area is also rich in water, which China desperately needs, as many of its water sources have been polluted by decades of communist mismanagement. The weather is also taking its toll. Years of drought have stretched water reserves further. Some of China's rivers, like the Yangtze, which provides water for more than 400 million people, are losing volume. Between 2018 and 2022, water flows along the Yangtze's main route were 50% below the average. In August 2022, Chinese authorities were forced to discharge 980 million cubic meters of water from reservoirs to replenish the river, and the drought meant that 780,000 people needed government support. Yet, despite the contracting supply, demand is increasing. By 2030, China's demand for water will surpass 800 billion cubic meters. Historically, water shortages have been a cause for war and China's water problems have made its neighbors like India and Vietnam, which it already has frosty relations with, nervous. Perhaps Russia will need to be added to the list as the war in Ukraine continues without any notion of victory in sight, and with China seeing more and more opportunity to capitalize on its weakened strategic partner. Although China has a historical basis to claim Outer Manchuria, there are other territories further to the north that could prove even worthier for Chinese interest. Outer Manchuria is only part of the Russian Far East. This region is sparsely populated but has many valuable resources. In 2019, Russia launched its 3,000-kilometer-long Power of Siberia pipeline. The pipeline sends natural gas from fields in the Russian Far East directly to China. For China, securing control of the region, its resources, and its infrastructure would go a long way to making it energy self-sufficient. Overall, China is investing more heavily in the Russian Far East than the Russian government itself is. For example, it's pledged to spend $28 billion on developing 13 ports and has already spent $14.7 billion on agricultural projects in the region. China is also sending its nationals into the Russian Far East in great numbers, whether the migration is legal or not. Some demographers predict that in 20 to 30 years, there will be more Han Chinese people in the area than ethnic Russians, and there is already tension between the more established locals and the new arrivals. We saw hints of this in 2019, when Siberian authorities had to halt the construction of a bottling plant on Lake Baikal, the world's largest freshwater lake that has nearly 20% of the world's surface freshwater. Locals feared that the China-owned Aquasib company's plans to bottle 190 million liters of water per year and send them to a thirsty Chinese marketplace would drain the lake. Nearly 1 million people signed an online petition against the plant by the middle of March 2019. One local quoted by the New York Times said of the plant, If we let them, the Chinese will take over. They will just steal all the money and the local people will get nothing. Locals back then were also saying that Chinese tourists referred to Lake Baikal by its ancient Han name, the Northern Sea. It was a sentiment that anticipated the Chinese Ministry of Natural Resources map four years later. Additionally, the Russian Far East is a gateway to the Arctic. China has had long Arctic ambitions and has called itself a near-Arctic state. China covets greater influence in the Arctic because of the region's natural resources. These include hydrocarbon reserves, 
minerals, and fisheries, the latter of which China has severely depleted near its home waters due to overfishing. In addition to being an energy insecure nation, China is also food insecure, and seizing valuable fishing spots is one of the reasons for its aggressive expansion into the South China Sea. For China, where fish is in high demand, these Arctic fisheries would be extremely valuable. Additionally, China views the Arctic as a potentially useful military and technological testing ground, and its ability to project hard power there would give it greater leverage in its negotiations with the United States. China has invested $90 billion in Arctic Circle-related projects since 2003. In 2018, Beijing announced plans to develop a polar silk road. Its investments, via state-owned entities and other companies with close ties to the Chinese government, include a 12.5% stake in the $1.4 billion Kvarnafjeld uranium project in Greenland, a 60% stake in Drekki and Gomur, which are two potential oil and gas shelves in Iceland, a biodiesel plant in Finland, and a 20% stake in the Novatech natural gas project in Russia's Yamal Peninsula. China also attempted to invest in a gold mine in Canada, but Ottawa blocked the move over security concerns. An annexation of the entire Russian Far East would be enormously beneficial for China, in terms of resources and geopolitical strength, but that's not the only potential point of contention between these supposed unlimited strategic partners. Central Asia is a point of contention as well. This region is comprised of former Soviet states, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan, and Uzbekistan. Although the Soviet Union has collapsed, that didn't mean the end of Moscow's involvement in the region and it has always considered itself the area's preeminent power. Despite their proximity, these countries are economically isolated from each other, which works to Russia's advantage since they were heavily dependent on remittances from Russia before its invasion of Ukraine. However, Beijing has increasingly muscled in on Moscow's former prerogative in recent years. The region is critical for the success of China's Belt and Road Initiative, as it sits on the crossroads between East Asia and Europe. Xi Jinping, has also planned to use the region as a gateway to Pakistan and the Indian Ocean. All of the countries in the region have signed a memorandum of understanding related to the Belt and Road Initiative, and all but Turkmenistan are members of the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. China has invested over $1 trillion in its BRI over the last 10 years. The sum could reach up to $8 trillion by the time it's all done. In 2018, China signed contracts worth a cumulative total of $304.9 billion with the Central Asian countries. For China, bringing the backwater Central Asian region out of its isolation is part of its geostrategic competition with the United States. It wants to see a world where more people travel across the Eurasian landmass via its BRI infrastructure projects, like rail lines. In turn, it wants to reduce the amount of people that fly across the Atlantic to the United States. Its moves in Central Asia are meant to help reorient the center of world commerce. Aside from its geostrategic importance to China, the Central Asian countries host an abundance of natural resources. For example, Kazakhstan has an estimated 30 billion barrels of oil. Turkmenistan, meanwhile, has large natural gas reserves, amounting to the world's fifth biggest. China sees this area as important in mitigating its energy disadvantages. For example, Turkmenistan is already China's second-largest supplier of natural gas as of 2021, a convenient arrangement since this route goes overland directly to Chinese territory. More energy coming from Central Asia would lessen the need for it to import its oil and natural gas through the contested waters and choke points of the first island chain. A greater Chinese presence in the Central Asian energy market would also give it more leverage in its negotiations with the European Union which has long sought to deepen ties in the region to counteract its dependence on Russian oil and natural gas. Central Asia also has vast mineral resources. Tajikistan is one of the world's largest silver deposits in Konimansur. Tajikistan is also rich in gold, as is Kyrgyzstan. Central Asia boasts large deposits of rare earth elements too. These 17 materials, like erbium and tulium, are vital for the modern digital economy. Everything from wind turbines to household appliances use them. Studies from the World Bank and other organizations suggest that demand for rare earth elements will increase between two and eight times over the coming decades. China currently controls between 50 and 60 percent of the mining supply and about 90 percent of the intermediate processing stage of these elements. Even so, internal demand in China has outstripped supply as of March 2022. 
Central Asia is a means to secure that supply for the greater demand. Despite its prevalence of rare earth elements, this industry is relatively underdeveloped in Central Asia, and the region continues to depend heavily on its energy sector. Greater Chinese investment in the region with the aim of diversifying the economies of the Central Asian region would give Beijing even more of a voice there. There is another problem for Russia, as China has much more to offer the Central Asian countries economically than their supposed benefactor. This was true before the sanctions over the invasion of Ukraine and is even truer today. China already invests more in the region than Russia does, with plans to invest further. Up until now, Russia has been able to live with China's activities in Central Asia because it's been more interested in security matters than in economic ones. The two countries have also cooperated on security matters. For example, following the Taliban's regaining of power in Afghanistan in 2021, Russia and China initiated a close bilateral dialogue to monitor the situation and conduct joint counterterrorism exercises. Containing the Taliban to Afghanistan's borders is an item of high priority for both Moscow and Beijing. Experts are divided as to whether this power-sharing arrangement in Central Asia is coincidental or down to an informal policy understanding between the two big guys in the region. However, China's security plays in Central Asia are growing too. In October 2021, China took full control of a military base near Tajikistan's border with Afghanistan. The base is also near China's small border of less than 100 kilometers with Afghanistan at the Wakhan Corridor. The base is manned not by China's People's Liberation Army, but rather its People's Armed Police Force. This is the same unit responsible for internal security in its western Xinjiang province, where according to many international governments like the United States and United Kingdom, China is perpetrating a genocide on its Uyghur Muslim minority. Meanwhile, officials in Tajikistan have announced that China will build another base, to the tune of $10 million, in the eastern gorno badakhshan autonomous province near the Pamir Mountains. Chinese troops were not to be stationed there, but that could change. China has long feared Islamic terrorism and separatism in Xinjiang, sometimes irrationally. Its security interest in Central Asia is an extension of Beijing's desire to keep these forces under control. With the region becoming more economically dependent on China, Beijing's future terms could include more of a military presence there. This would especially be the case if Russia, the traditional security guarantor in Central Asia, sees its military slowly and steadily bled white in Ukraine. China's aid to Russia in the war seems designed to make Moscow increasingly dependent on Beijing. China has become the world's largest importer of Russian energy, and this has been critical for the latter's ability to make up at least some of the shortfall coming from the Western sanctions and loss of the European market. But this is not altruism on part of the Chinese. China is using its currency, the yuan, in most of its purchases. As a result, total Russian exports being conducted in yuan jumped from 0.5% prior to February 22 to 14% in October 2023. This arrangement is convenient for Beijing as it strengthens the yuan. It's not so great for Moscow, as the Chinese energy purchases are steadily leaving Russia with a huge amount of yuan reserves that are of limited use on the global market. This reality makes Russia even more dependent on China, because it won't be able to make many international purchases with its vast yuan stockpile. The only country that will unhesitatingly take that currency is, you guessed it, China. Meanwhile, what passes as China's military aid seems designed to keep the war a prolonged dispute. The parts and other equipment China is supplying to Russia has so far been enough to prevent its military from being defeated outright, but it's not enough to tip the scales in favor of its supposed strategic partner. In March 2023, Xi Jinping met Vladimir Putin in a summit in Moscow. He did not pledge increased military aid to Russia, which Putin strongly desired. China did release a 12-point peace plan at the meeting. Point 10 was favorable to Russia, as it announced China's opposition to unilateral sanctions unauthorized by the UN Security Council. This is convenient since China and Russia have two of the five permanent seats on that body with the associated veto power. The rest of the peace plan was vague, however. Conveniently vague for China. The first point of the plan about national sovereignty said that the sovereignty, independence, and territorial integrity of all countries must be effectively upheld. The statement further encouraged all countries to follow international norms. The statement and the rest of the plan did not mention Russia's supposed annexation of the territories it occupies in eastern Ukraine. Does China recognize these new territories or not? No one knows, presumably including Putin. Instead, China encouraged further dialogue to end the war. 
secure supply chains, keep nuclear power plants safe, and honor the agreements signed by Russia, Ukraine, Turkey, and the UN on the export of grain through the Black Sea. With Russia withdrawing from this agreement later in the year, and with its threats to the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant, these statements are at least not as encouraging as Vladimir Putin would have liked. It seems there are limits to the supposed no-limits partnership after all. China's position on Ukraine is deliberately vague, in order to give it the biggest advantage. Long before the invasion of Ukraine, China had become by far the stronger of the two parties within the partnership. Now it's making Russia much more dependent on its market, while it gets to keep its options open. If Russia somehow manages to eke out something it can claim as a victory in Ukraine, or at least doesn't lose, China gets to benefit from the new status quo. As victory for the Kremlin will be Pyrrhic, sanctions will be unlikely to lift anytime soon, and China will be able to capitalize on Russia's isolation. Perhaps one day it will force Russia to support everything it does in Central Asia, or grant it vast privileges in the Russian Far East. More dramatically, China could one day claim that it must march into the historical or now majority ethnically Chinese territories in the Russian Far East to protect them, using the exact same justification that Russia used to invade Ukraine. This is less likely, but it wouldn't be the first time that China made outrageous territorial claims and used military force to secure them. All in all, China and Russia are like-minded authoritarian countries who want to expand their clout at America's expense. However, as Russia weakens while China becomes stronger in their relative balance of power, it would not be surprising to see Beijing play its newfound strength to the hilt. As the Kremlin is already learning, there is a high price to be paid for friendship with the Chinese Communist Party. But what do you think? Will the war in Ukraine leave Russia vulnerable to Chinese ambitions? Could China one day treat its supposed strategic partner as a vassal state or even seize its territory? Don't forget to let us know in the comments. Also, don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe for more military analysis from military experts. Will Putin eventually completely lose his marbles and start a nuclear war? This isn't just a hypothetical question, and here's why. Since the start of Russia's unprovoked invasion of Ukraine in 2022, the omnipresent threat of nuclear escalation has loomed over the conflict like a dark cloud. When Russia's fortunes decline, the world tends to hold its breath. The rationality of the man with his finger on the nuclear button makes it hard to predict whether further defeat and embarrassment on the battlefield will drive him closer to a nuclear contingency. Now with news emerging that Putin has officially revoked Russia's ratification of a global nuclear test ban, uncertainty is rising. Introduced in 1996, the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty, or CTBT, was designed to prevent all nuclear explosions worldwide, including those performed during a nuclear test. Having adhered to the ban for more than two decades, Putin's landmark about-face is worth keeping an eye on. The latest in a series of calculated moves to intimidate Ukraine and its Western supporters. Putin's decision underscores the paucity of military options available to him as his force is depleted and his regional military aims go unrealized. Sure, this could just be the type of nuclear saber-rattling that we've grown accustomed to, but the news could also prove catastrophic. With thousands of nuclear weapons in its arsenal, the resumption of nuclear testing by Russia is just the type of escalatory sign the world has hoped to avoid ever since the Russians invaded Ukraine in February of 2022. What was Russia's rationale for making this change, and what bearing might it have on the conflict in Ukraine and the future nuclear relations between the world's superpowers? First, Putin's rationale. Citing their own security interests, unsurprisingly, Russian leaders claim the decision was adopted in response to the United States' own blatant disregard for the global nuclear test ban. And technically they're right. Ironically, the US itself never ratified the CTBT when it was passed in 1996. To understand why, we should go back in time to understand why the CTBT came about in the first place. Introduced at the end of the Cold War, the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty imposed a global suspension on all nuclear testing above or below ground. It was proposed by UN Mandate 33 years after the American and Soviet superpowers came dangerously close to mutually assured destruction during the Cuban Missile Crisis in October 1962. In the immediate aftermath of that standoff, delegates from both nations entered into negotiations to sign a limited nuclear test ban treaty, an agreement which allowed nations to conduct underground nuclear tests but went so far as to prohibit nuclear experimentation underwater, in Earth's atmosphere, and in space. 
signed by the Soviet Union, Great Britain, and the United States. At the time, the treaty was overwhelmingly supported by the American Senate, which approved it in an 80-19 margin. Many hailed the limited test ban treaty as the start of warming relations and closer cooperation between President John F. Kennedy's United States government and the Soviet Premier Nikita Khrushchev's communist regime. Indeed, it marked the first arms control agreement of the Cold War. No more radioactive fallout in the atmosphere, no more radioactive material in the ocean, things were looking up. The limited test ban treaty was followed by further arms control agreements during the Cold War, including the Non-Proliferation Treaty in 1968 and the SALT-1 agreements of 1972. Two years later, a threshold test ban treaty managed to further limit underground nuclear testing by constraining explosions to a maximum yield of 150 kilotons. According to the nuclear fireball calculator, that meant explosions with fireballs no more than 5.4 seconds long and a burst height of 1,022 meters. These piecemeal measures were touted as a success. The agreements were not only ecologically sound, they brought the two sides into dialogue, a helpful tool when you're trying to manage a major rivalry which could at any second endanger the survival of the entire human race. They restricted the number of nuclear missile silos and submarine-launched missile tubes. They helped keep hundreds of non-nuclear signatories, well, non-nuclear. And they established hotlines between the two countries which came in handy during the period of detente in the 1970s. The problem was that they never fully got over the line. They could not lead the superpowers into general disarmament, the ultimate aim of nuclear arms control after all. Both superpowers remained hell-bent on achieving nuclear superiority over the other after the treaties at almost any cost. It was the best way to maintain one's killer edge during the Cold War. This meant the development of newer, deadlier delivery systems and launch platforms, including strategic bombers and better nuclear submarines, whose testing and use were still largely unregulated. These issues were supposed to be addressed at the SALT II agreements, but before it could pass, tensions once again overshadowed negotiations. The Soviet Union invaded Afghanistan, no surprise there, and the Carter administration responded by funding Mujahideen resistance, also no surprise, pulling out of the 1980 Moscow Olympics and putting a general freeze on the SALT II negotiations. Then followed the well-known Reaganite reforms, a sweeping military modernization program which again turned the Cold War on its head and rekindled tension between the two powers. In turn, NATO began deploying advanced Pershing II missiles in Western Europe, more than capable of striking key targets in Russia, causing widespread anti-nuclear protests throughout Europe. Doubling down, Reagan resists appeasement to the Soviet Union, labeling it the Evil Empire. He sponsors the Strategic Defensive Initiative SDI, a space-based ballistic missile shield that could protect against a Soviet nuclear attack. The Soviets, overwhelmed by economic setbacks, grow increasingly wary of a widening technological gap with the West. And then Soviet General Secretary Mikhail Gorbachev and Reagan became, well, frenemies, I guess. At a short-notice summit in Iceland in 1986, they agreed to virtually abolish their nuclear arsenals over the next 10 years. But the Soviets, irritated with the Americans' disregard of a pre-existing treaty, limiting the testing required to pursue the SDI, blocked the passage of any agreement at Reykjavik. It took five long years to get anything across the line, but after agreeing to a joint US-Soviet program to research underground test detection in December 1987, in 1991, the two returned to center stage and passed the Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces INF, treaty, which basically did away with ground-launched mid-range nuclear missiles. It's the first agreement to reduce nuclear arms, as opposed to settling ceilings, and it introduced comprehensive verification measures, an important turning point for the negotiations to come. So by the time you get to the end of the Cold War, you have accelerating US-Soviet disarmament talks and a general spirit of optimism pervading their old Cold War stomping grounds. The 1990 START Treaty managed to reduce each side's massive arsenal of more than 10,000 warheads to less than 6,000 by 2009. They were increasingly inspecting each other's underground testing facilities and capabilities, and there was hopes the world might be able to come to some sort of overarching agreement on nuclear disarmament. Then things sort of got complicated. Conditions to pursue a long-term comprehensive test ban were ripe in the mid-1990s. In 1993, the United Nations initiated negotiations. 
It took three years to thrash out a viable treaty draft, and while in 1996 the United States General Assembly managed to adopt the CTBT with 71 signatories, a number which has grown to 177 by November 2023, three of the eight nuclear-capable states signed but never ratified the treaty. And that's where we get into Putin's alleged rationale for backing Russia out of its own ratification of the treaty. You see, while Russia was among the five nuclear-capable states at the time to ratify the CTBT in 1996, the United States wasn't. This put them in, well, shall we say, interesting company. Joining them are India, North Korea, China, Iran, Egypt, Israel, and Pakistan. Lacking the signature of the lone global superpower, the treaty was seen as more of a guideline than anything binding. While much of the world has maintained the CTBT's ban on nuclear explosions, it hasn't stopped rogue states like North Korea from experimenting from time to time. So why didn't the United States ratify the CTBT? Wasn't it in their best interest? Well, they certainly tried. In order to ratify the treaty, the United States had to pass it through the Senate first. Maybe you're getting Wilsonian flashbacks of the failed bid to approve American participation in the League of Nations after World War I, and it was a similar sort of outcome here too. Senate Republicans delayed bringing the CTBT to a vote for three years until July 1999, when all 45 Senate Democrats signed a letter demanding that it receive a hearing and a vote. The Republicans predictably ignored them. It took a threat from Democratic Senator Byron Dorgan to impede all Senate business until it was brought to vote to get the desired result, and so it went to a vote. Senate Republicans weren't too scared. They felt they had all the votes they needed to block the CTBT, so they agreed immediately. This took Senate Democrats and the White House off guard, making provisions for 18 hours of debate under the agreement that both parties would only be able to introduce a single amendment to the bill Senate Democrats further inflamed their Republican peers by hobbling their ability to bring up various concerns they might have had about the bill. They, in turn, basically sabotaged the bill so that it would not pass. When it went to a vote, the ratification of the CTBT was defeated 51 to 48. The Republicans weren't acting out of sheer spite, though it may seem like that. They had several primary concerns that prevented them from fully supporting ratification. Foremost among them, they feared the US simply could not maintain a reliable nuclear arsenal, the bedrock of its deterrence against revisionist superpowers like Russia and China today, without the provision of future testing. Second, they rightly lacked confidence that foreign cheaters could be adequately detected. Measures were adopted after the signing of the treaty aimed at promoting the safety and reliability of American nuclear tests. They stopped underground testing, shifting their focus to maintaining the arsenals they currently possessed. Among them was the Stockpile Stewardship Program, which enabled the US to continue testing its nuclear arsenal, the last warhead having been constructed in 1992, in tightly managed facilities capable of replicating heat and pressure conditions when a nuclear weapon is detonated, but without the actual blast itself. Since the youngest American nuke is actually at least 30 years old, Mitigating risk of failure is a real concern. The US has not tested nuclear weapons since 1992, which leaves the task of its stockpile maintenance to the use of simulations, using non-nuclear explosive tests and supercomputers among other methods, and other science-based solutions. Maintaining America's nuclear credibility is therefore a complex, expensive, and daunting task, one for which it is dependent on continued testing if it's to preserve its existing stockpiles without having to resort to building more. Still, since 1996, the directors of the National Nuclear Laboratory and the commander of Strategic Command, responsible for the nation's nuclear deterrent, have both had to annually certify their confidence in America's nuclear reliability. And since then, both have claimed there is little need for further testing, casting doubt over the failure to ratify the CTBT. Doubts over cheating are also questionable, the CTBT maintains its own UN-sponsored global monitoring system, paid for and maintained by all partner nations. With almost 300 surveillance stations across the world, the monitoring system can detect a nuclear test with a yield as low as one kiloton. Several American agencies, including the National Academy of Sciences, have expressed satisfaction with this monitoring system, claiming it can even detect a 0.1 to 0.2 kiloton explosion as pronounced as they were in the mid-1990s, 
By 2016, concerns over cheating no longer held sway as Republicans continued to resist ratification of the treaty. Failure to back the CTBT has damaged US credibility on the global stage. Today, Russia is using that failure as fuel for its own decision to revoke its ratification of the treaty. There's never a good time to back out of nuclear arms treaties, but especially today when Russian state stability has never been in greater doubt, when its ties to other revisionist and experimental nuclear powers like Iran are being increasingly strengthened and as their disregard for the liberal international order grows. Iran is believed to have enriched uranium to 86% after President Donald Trump revoked the Iranian nuclear deal. Many fear a test could occur at any time. Even more damaging, Iran could skip the testing process and covertly build out its own nuclear arsenal under the noses of the world's major powers and before they could do much to stop it. Needless to say, this would be a calamity of the first order. Escalating tensions with Iran's regional adversaries, Jordan and Saudi Arabia, who have promised to pursue nuclear programs of their own if Iran succeeds. Peace is always fleeting in the Middle East, but it becomes almost unimaginable if any power in that region gains access to a nuclear warhead. Further east, Pakistan and India are enveloped in age-old tensions of their own. Border skirmishes continue. It wouldn't take much for either side to return to nuclear tests as a way of intimidating the other. Signing into law the withdrawal of its ratification of the CTBT, Russian politicians claim the decision was made in their own self-interest and in their words, as a mirror response to the actions of the United States. The claims fall short of credibility, especially as nuclear threats and active violations of neighbors' territorial sovereignty have gone hand in hand over the past few years. It's all rhetoric. Russia knows it cannot resort to nuclear weapons because it knows it cannot handle the consequences. It would jeopardize its alliance with China. It would further galvanize the West. It would put its entire population at risk. Not that that last part matters much to Putin. You probably remember when Putin and his lackeys started threatening to rain down tactical nuclear destruction on the Ukrainian battlefield. Well, the United States didn't take kindly to that. They immediately initiated a back-channel conversation with Russia's defense minister and, almost miraculously, the threats ceased shortly thereafter. It's impossible to know what they said, but it shed light on one of Putin's few remaining cards his repeated attempts to bully the West into inaction and limit Western intervention by threatening to put his nuclear forces on high alert. The announcement threw the Western media into a frenzy, but of course achieved little of its true intended effect. No matter what Putin says, Western nuclear weapons will continuously remain in a state of high alert, and barring an actual nuclear strike, the West will continue to ferry weapons and aid into Ukraine. Perhaps thinking his threats did not go far enough, Putin then thought it would be a good idea to move some of his nuclear weapons into Belarus. Again, this was just a ploy to stoke Western fears. What it really achieved was bringing Russian nukes into closer range of NATO's rapid response and first strike forces, and conferred virtually no advantage in targeting NATO cities or bases, besides shaving a minute off their flight time. Really, this renewed threat only brought down more pressure on the shaky Lukashenko government in Belarus and brought them into closer proximity to Russian mercenary groups which had traditionally operated out of that region. Putin remains a master strategist. In light of past threats, Russia's departure from the CTBT may indeed be another failed attempt at fear-mongering. The scope and extent of Russia's ability to conduct its own nuclear tests are relatively unknown, but it's likely they are not as clear-cut as Putin would hope. Like the US, Putin must navigate significant legal hurdles to do so. In light of the hundreds of millions of rubles being sunk into the war in Ukraine, it's unlikely Putin's autocratic regime even possesses the financial resources required to greenlight modern testing or produce additional nuclear weapons, a process which not only includes the purchasing of the bomb itself, but the purchase and maintenance of delivery systems, equipment, personnel, and secure renovated facilities. The world would almost certainly apply even greater economic pressure if a test were detected. What's more, ex-Soviet citizens living near old test ranges simply don't want them to resume. It's true that a nuclear test might signal to the West what idle threats cannot, Putin's commitment to putting his money where his mouth is. After announcing its intention to reverse its ratification of the CTBT, just recently Russia announced a successful submarine test launch 
of one of its Bulava intercontinental ballistic missiles expressly designed to deliver a nuclear warhead to a target. There was obviously no warhead attached, but such public displays fall into the category of threat we've all grown accustomed to. Russia's accompanying withdrawal from the CTBT only heightens global insecurity and lends such threats marginally more weight. NATO has pledged not to be deterred by nuclear blackmail and vowed to increase support of Ukraine in light of such provocations, but the nuclear slope is a slippery one. The West must stand resolutely opposed to nuclear blackmail and terrorism. If Putin gets his way, the rest of the world feel emboldened to disregard the types of collaborative treaties that have helped keep nuclear warheads out of combat since 1945. Even likelier, random tests and shows of force could backfire on Putin. Would anyone really be surprised if news comes out that an ex-Soviet warhead randomly detonated in an unreliable silo? Or if a threat to nuke Ukraine somehow went awry and they accidentally nuked themselves? Putin is running a real risk of alienating those few nations from which he still somehow enjoys support. The world has not forgotten the terror of the Cold War. Everyone on the planet knows that a nuclear exchange will have severe ramifications even in the most remote areas. After so much bloodshed, instability and uncertainty, Putin launching a nuke on Ukraine, mishandling a nuclear test, or creating a nuclear disaster in his own country could be the straw that breaks the camel's back. While the United States presses forward developing cutting-edge testing methods which can simulate and study the final stages of a nuclear weapon implosion short of an actual detonation, giving them accurate insight on how its 30-year-old weapons will operate and when it's time to replace them, Russia will resort to the cheaper and far more destabilizing option. Where that leads is anyone's guess, but it won't be anywhere good. But what do you think? Is Putin starting a nuclear war an actual risk? Or will sanity prevail even when, and we do believe it's when, not if, he is ultimately defeated in the Ukraine conflict? Let us know in the comments and don't forget to subscribe for more military analysis from military experts. World wars lead to the loss of millions of lives, the dissolution of empires, the vanishing of states from the global landscape, the emergence of new nations, the birth of numerous innovations, and the creation of a transformed global reality. Simply put, they change everything, as clearly demonstrated by World War I and especially World War II. But what would happen if World War III started today? How would it start? Let's be real, the probability of such a war is always there. It can be both accidental and purposeful. Accidents may encompass technical failures in nuclear weapons facilities, human errors, the commandeering of control systems by terrorist organizations within the nuclear-armed states, and the unintended launch of nuclear-armed missiles due to external elements such as UFO sightings, natural disasters, or extraterrestrial anomalies like solar flares. It can even be false alarms or computer viruses, such a false trigger to start a war. But the most obvious reason would probably be the escalation of long-term conflicts. Among the serious conflicts capable of provoking the start of a world war could be the aggravation of the dispute between China and the United States regarding the status of Taiwan and world supremacy. Another very possible scenario is the escalation of the war in Ukraine by the Kremlin. Despite the fact that the probability of a direct military confrontation between NATO and Russia is still low, the risk of an escalation of the conflict exists. Even a local conflict between Turkey and Greece can have a huge impact. At first glance, it may seem that this is not serious enough for the beginning of the Third World War. However, if the conflict between these NATO member states escalates into military confrontation, it could have negative consequences for the entire world. The conflict on the Korean Peninsula, the territorial disputes between Pakistan and India, the war in Syria, the Gaza Strip, and other points of conflict are worth mentioning. No one thought that the murder in Sarajevo would lead to the deaths of millions, but it happened. Some countries openly go into conflict or are ready for it. On occasion, they mention their nuclear arsenal or military power. Several of these nations find themselves marginalized by the global community, including North Korea, Iran, and recently Russia. Rogue countries and authoritarian states are the most dangerous, in particular because of the less predictable nature of leaders' actions and fewer institutional constraints. In general, a purposeful conflict can occur due to the redistribution of political and economic spheres of influence or a lack of resources. 
the attack on any country of the nuclear club, the use of weapons by any member of the nuclear club against a non-member country due to a threat to national security, and a retaliatory strike by another member of the nuclear club in defense of the weaker one can also provoke a war. What situations almost led to the beginning of the Third World War in the past? Even before the end of the Second World War, there was talk of a Third World War. History counts many examples when small military conflicts could become the beginning of the Third World War. In the period between 1945 and the revolutions in 1989 that led to the collapse of the Eastern Bloc, the apocalyptic scenario of a Third World War was viewed primarily as a possible confrontation between the superpowers, the USA, and the Soviet Union. Several times during this period, the superpowers found themselves on the brink of direct military conflict. At the beginning of the Berlin blockade on June 24, 1948, the military governor of the American Zone of Occupation, General Lucius D. Clay, proposed breaking the blockade with an armed convoy. However, American President Harry S. Truman rejected this because of the associated risk of war. In the Korean War, 1950-53, there was a constant danger of escalation. For example, General Douglas MacArthur was accused of wanting to use nuclear weapons against China. During the Suez Crisis of 1956, Soviet Minister Mykola Bulganin sent a note to British Prime Minister Antony Eden with a warning. If this war does not stop, it would be in danger of turning into the Third World War. The Cuban Missile Crisis of 1962 is considered the point at which the risk of World War III was greatest, and Robert McNamara has stated that if not for Vasyl Akhapov, who prevented a nuclear launch on a Soviet submarine at the height of the crisis, then World War III would have started. The same thing happened later. On September 26, 1983, Soviet early warning stations under the command of Stanislav Petrov mistakenly detected five intercontinental ballistic missiles. Petrov correctly assessed the situation as a false alarm and did not report his discovery to his superiors. Petrov's actions most likely helped to avoid a nuclear conflict, since Soviet policy at the time would have caused a nuclear response after the detection of the ballistic missiles. Similar errors in notification systems also happened in the USA. Even military exercises can cause escalation. For example, NATO's Able Archer 83 exercise starting on November 2, 1983, was considered a possible provocation by the USSR. In response, it prepared to bring the nuclear forces and the air force in East Germany and Poland into a state of combat readiness. Other historical moments of tension were Sino-Soviet border conflicts in 1969, the Yom Kippur War superpower tensions, 6th to 25th October 1973, the Norwegian rocket incident on January 25, 1995, between Norway, the USA, and Russia, the incident at Pristina Airport on June 12, 1999, between NATO and Russia, and the shooting down of a Russian Shukhoi bomber by Turkey on November 24, 2015. As we can see, there was a lot of tension between the world's strongest states. These states have significant influence and many allies, so that can lead to a global conflict. Suppose that the USA, NATO countries, Israel, Taiwan, Ukraine, Australia, Japan, South Korea, and some other states would be involved in this war against China, Russia, Belarus, North Korea, Afghanistan, Iran, Syria, parts of the Arab countries, and some other states. Suppose that the position of many countries would fluctuate, but sooner or later they would be drawn into the war. So what would happen if the Third World War begins today? A possible answer is the nuclear threat and the destruction of the world. Considering the rapid advancements in potential scenarios for a Third World War featuring nuclear weapons, it's worth noting that the initial retaliatory strike, capable of annihilating the enemy's major cities and military installations, could transpire in a matter of minutes. As per calculations in the scientific journal of the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences, deploying 5,000 nuclear warheads with a combined yield of 2 gigatons on major cities in the Northern Hemisphere could result in the simultaneous demise of 750 million people due to a single destructive element, the shockwave. However, despite the existing military potential of the states that are members of the nuclear club, the likelihood of the use of nuclear weapons by these states remains low due to the current lack of an effective defense strategy that would be able to protect the aggressor from retribution from the victim. Attempts to create an effective missile defense system have had some success, for example, within the framework of the SDI program, but the effectiveness of such a system is far from 100%, and the risk of falling under a nuclear attack on one's own territory 
even on a much smaller scale than on the enemy's territory, is politically unacceptable for all developed countries. But would such a risk be unacceptable for, example, North Korea? Currently, the sole method of safeguarding against nuclear weapons is to place economically vital installations in deep underground bunkers. This is an exceptionally challenging endeavor from an economic perspective, and as a result, only highly critical defense entities such as NORAD, situated in Cheyenne Mountain, employ underground shelters. North American Aerospace Defense Command, a joint initiative of the United States and Canada, offers aerospace surveillance, air sovereignty, and protection for both countries. Nevertheless, in practice, the devastation of defense facilities, including military-industrial complexes and critical infrastructure like ports, bridges, transport hubs, and power plants, along with a significant civilian population residing near the target areas, while highly severe, is not an insurmountable catastrophe on the national and global scales. The presence of an effective civil defense system can substantially reduce civilian casualties. For instance, Switzerland has a well-established network of nuclear shelters, which, following the Fukushima nuclear incident, gained renewed importance as protection against potential man-made disasters of this kind. It's entirely plausible that a conflict involving thermonuclear weapons may extend beyond mere reciprocal bombings following the initial and retaliatory strikes. Instead, it could evolve into conventional warfare, with parties vying for control over specific theaters of military operations. The selective use of nuclear weapons might readily lead to further escalation and more extensive mutual destruction. Many countries have implemented civil defense systems, including underground subway networks, in preparation for war. However, the efficacy of underground shelters in preserving lives and aiding survival in a nuclear attack, while radiation remains elevated, remains a subject of debate. The beginning of a global nuclear war would look like this. Between the warning of the country's population about the beginning of a nuclear war and the explosion itself, there are no more than 10 to 14 minutes. The government receives earlier warnings if there are modern missile defense systems, but it takes time to trigger a general warning. Not so many people would be able to find underground shelter during this time. After this, millions of people who did not have time to find shelter would instantly become victims. But those who were able to survive the explosion would soon face a painful fate. Even far from the epicenter of the explosion, the territory would most likely be uninhabitable for many decades due to radiation. However, all the consequences of a nuclear war can only be discussed in theory. Even if a global atomic war does not lead to the death of all living things and humanity survives, it would survive as our ancestors did several hundred years ago. The technological and information wars are the keys to the 21st century. The Russian-Ukrainian war experience offers valuable insights into anticipating the dynamics of a potential Third World War. Notably, technology now plays an increasingly significant role in granting soldiers better territorial control. Regions previously patrolled by brigades of thousands are now overseen by battalions of several hundred. In Ukraine, around 350,000 Russian troops will be deployed along a 746-mile front in 2023, averaging about 469 soldiers per mile, considerably fewer than during World War II. On the surface, this might seem advantageous for attackers, as thinner front lines are easier to breach. Advanced sensors, precise ammunition, and improved digital networks enhance target identification and elimination. However, offensive forces must still concentrate to break through fortified front lines, which can be detected and targeted, albeit not always, but more frequently than before. Consequently, ground warfare experiences a notable shift in favor of the defender. This creates a paradox. High-precision warfare can offset some advantages of massive armies, but it doesn't entirely replace the need for numerical strength. Artificial intelligence would be everywhere in this war. The capabilities of advanced algorithmic combat systems are so formidable that their advantage can be likened to the superiority of tactical nuclear weapons over conventional ones. The kill chain, which outlines the steps for target destruction, enables the immediate retrieval and analysis of data from satellites, yielding the most precise real-time situational awareness. Equipped with this up-to-the-minute information, commanders can effectively navigate through the ambiguities inherent in warfare, often referred to as the fog of war. Utilizing AI, analysts discern the enemy's location and determine the most suitable weaponry for the current scenario. An essential function of these digital systems is to forecast and devise optimal combat strategies 
based on the prevailing circumstances. The tactics of the world's most advanced nations hinge on the swift deployment of rapid response units, drones, missiles, and aircraft. Yet these tactics prove pivotal, primarily in situations where the adversary lags in technology or the conflict remains geographically limited. The development and application of cutting-edge technologies would be a crucial factor in achieving success. The internet would emerge as a new global battleground, with initial attacks directed at the computer systems governing civilian and military operations. Gaining a strategic advantage involves disrupting the enemy's communication channels, sowing chaos, hindering their ability to respond to attacks, and mobilizing the population and military. Immediate assaults would also target computers that support critical city functions and infrastructure, including telecommunications, water supply, electricity, fire services, transportation, and more. Despite these measures, global conflict and widespread destruction would quickly become known to humanity. Online hostilities and propaganda campaigns would commence, accompanied by hacking operations targeting websites and servers to gather classified information or disseminate deceptive data that benefits another nation. In a prolonged conflict, a struggle for the support and allegiance of the general population would take place. The internet would serve as a more effective medium for propaganda compared to what existed in previous eras. This battle would extend to shaping the opinions of nations not yet engaged in the war. In a worldwide conflict, every potential resource becomes valuable. Information and various forms of pressure would foster instability in neutral countries, making global warfare a prevailing topic across the globe. Some nations, however, have robust safeguards such as stringent internet censorship. Yes, nothing happened in Tiananmen Square. Economic collapse, large-scale ruin, victims, and refugees, the long-term crisis would be a global legacy. A world war's aftermath would bring suffering to all. With each passing day adding to the toll of victims, the war would result in a staggering loss of life and mass displacement creating an unprecedented number of refugees and internally displaced individuals. Many would seize the chance to escape the conflict to neutral nations, seeking refuge from the battlegrounds. A global conflict would trigger substantial transformations in the world economy and supply chains. The initial days would be marred by panic in many countries, rapid price hikes, increased crime rates, traffic congestion, acts of terrorism, protests and more, rapid economic deterioration, would ensue as former key trading allies transform into opponents, with each side striving to cripple the resources of the other. The potential shifts in world GDP, oil production, human development indices, etc. are hard to fathom. The impact of the war would reverberate across all aspects of people's lives. For many countries, the consequences may surpass those of previous global financial crises, jeopardizing their stability and preparedness for conflict. The resulting humanitarian crisis would be unprecedented, paralleled by the destruction of humanity's cultural heritage, infrastructure, and all other assets. A protracted conflict would lay the groundwork for a possible worldwide famine, particularly in the most vulnerable nations. Even neutral states would suffer significantly as the warring factions prioritize their own interests over all else. It's difficult to even imagine the ecological consequences of such a disaster. Any military conflict causes enormous damage to the environment, Ecosystems cannot be divided by conventional boundaries by drawing them on a map. If the natural balance is destroyed in one geolocation, it will definitely be felt in another. The global war will result in numerous explosions in fuel and lubricant depots and petroleum product storage facilities, leading to environmental repercussions. These will encompass air raids on facilities utilizing hazardous chemicals in their manufacturing processes, along with the disruption and destruction of treatment plants resulting in sewage contamination of water bodies. Furthermore, it will cause harm to the soil cover and extensive forest fires, particularly in protected natural areas. Thousands of plant species may face extinction as a result of the conflict. The warfare disrupts the tranquility of wildlife, causing them to either perish or seek refuge to escape the conflict zones. Military operations will unfold in regions of international significance, eradicating habitats for rare and unique species, thereby potentially altering bird behavior, including migration patterns. Forests, essential for global food security, and playing a protective role, will be decimated by combat operations, impacting the climate and potentially triggering substantial erosion, including wind erosion and desertification. All of these consequences will inevitably have repercussions for agriculture. During rocket and projectile detonations, a range of chemical compounds forms, including carbon monoxide, brown gas, nitrogen dioxide, formaldehyde, and more. 
The explosion results in the complete oxidation of these substances, releasing the products of this chemical reaction into the atmosphere. Importantly, polluted air transcends borders. Emissions generated by the war traverse, settle, and impact the territories of other nations, often at distances spanning thousands of miles. Landmine detonations contaminate the soil with heavy metals like lead, strontium, titanium, cadmium, and nickel. This contamination renders the soil hazardous and, in some cases, unfit for future agricultural purposes. Explosions also give rise to forest fires. The potential outcomes of a nuclear war have the theoretical capacity to trigger catastrophic shifts in the planet's climate and environmental conditions, commonly referred to as a nuclear winter or nuclear autumn. This perspective has significantly influenced the role of nuclear weapons as a tool of strategic deterrence, discouraging adversaries from initiating a nuclear conflict. In the worst case, a substantial volume of nuclear fallout would disperse globally, resulting in a prolonged increase in background radiation on Earth that can cause the death of billions. A new world war, new opportunities. As the saying goes, maintaining optimism even in the direst situations is crucial. Let's attempt to identify positive aspects in the event of World War III erupting today. Firstly, it's important to recognize that, ultimately, the conflict will come to an end, paving the way for peace. The aftermath of the war will undoubtedly trigger a profound and unpredictable transformation in the landscape of international relations. Countries will need to swiftly adapt to these shifts in the midst of ongoing turmoil and violence. Comprehending these potential consequences reaffirms the critical need for global leaders to prioritize diplomacy over warfare as we navigate our interconnected future. As geopolitical structures evolve, influential international organizations such as the United Nations and the World Health Organization may see their roles and authority challenged due to decreased cooperation among powerful nations. This could open the door for the emergence of new institutions and organizations dedicated to addressing urgent global challenges that arise during times of conflict. Amidst the wreckage of the old world, Opportunities for growth and advancement may emerge if humanity can safeguard its previous accomplishments. Wars often stimulate rapid technological advancements as countries allocate substantial resources to research and development for military purposes. Once the dust settles, these technologies may transition to civilian applications, accelerating overall societal progress. For example, innovations in areas like post-conflict reconstruction, environmental restoration and medical advancements may bring about positive changes. The devastating consequences of World War III can underscore humanity's shared aspiration for peace and a collective commitment for preventing the recurrence of such catastrophic events. The collective trauma experienced during this conflict will have profound and far-reaching effects. It can prompt introspection regarding past mistakes and drive us to seek more diplomatic solutions as we move forward. Due to the extensive impact of World War III on countries worldwide, governments may be inclined to strengthen diplomatic bonds with one another in an effort to avoid future conflicts. This renewed emphasis on diplomacy has the potential to usher in a new era of international cooperation and peaceful dispute resolution. Such a movement towards an ideal world is possible even without war, but a lot still needs to be done for it. What if World War III never happened? In this scenario, the world would persist along its current trajectory. Periodically, Local conflicts, revolutions, and wars may emerge. Economic rivalries, military exercises, and the quest for influence would remain integral to the major powers. However, the overarching result would be global peace and stability for the majority of the world's populace. Nations would increasingly shift their focus towards economic and social advancement rather than engaging in military confrontations. This outlook would become more prevalent across the globe. The frequency of conflicts and casualties would gradually diminish. The absence of war paves the way for economic expansion. Countries would no longer need to allocate extensive resources to massive military expenditures, enabling greater investments in infrastructure, education, and healthcare. Scientific research and innovation can thrive in an environment of healthy competition and the innate human aspiration for improved living standards. Over time, international cooperation would strengthen through heightened accountability fortified diplomatic relations, and active participation in global initiatives addressing issues such as climate change, global health, and poverty reduction. The absence of large-scale conflicts would safeguard millions of lives and the existing environment. Art and culture would also prosper during peacetime, as would social well-being. Populations across the globe could enjoy enhanced social conditions, improved living standards, 
and increased access to education and healthcare. The future If World War III were to occur in today's world, it would emerge as a global conflict involving numerous nations and would have profound implications for the state of international relations. The worldwide scope of such a conflict has the potential to reshape the established global order. Many powerful countries would probably lose their role. The dynamics of a global conflict in the 21st century would be fundamentally influenced by technological advancements, yet it would likely be a protracted engagement. In this context, the internet would play a pivotal role. Initially, cyber attacks on systems governing civilian and military infrastructure would be a primary target. The primary objectives would encompass disrupting communications networks and sowing chaos. Subsequent phases of the conflict would involve online propaganda, hacking and disinformation campaigns, further intensifying the confrontation. Given the global reach of the internet, even neutral countries would be drawn into this information warfare. The immediate aftermath of such a world war would entail economic collapse, widespread devastation and severe environmental damage. However, amid this destruction, there may emerge opportunities for recovery and advancement if humanity can preserve its prior achievements. Diplomacy, cooperation and the pursuit of peace would become even more crucial in the post-war era. There is no need for another world war to understand such basic things. Humanity should strengthen the influence of international organizations that help states and people resolve conflicts. Politicians must understand that cooperation with others is important for global stability. Many recipes for presenting wars are offered, from economic integration and globalization of the world to building up one's own army. The only common thing is the understanding that if the Third World War started today, tomorrow might not come. Millions of people would be mobilized to the battlefield, and cruelty and anger would become commonplace for the millions or billions of broken hearts of those who survived. Analysis of the prospects of this war is important for the realization of all mankind. There will be no winners in this war. Do you think there would be? Let us know in the comments, and don't forget to subscribe for more military content and analysis. In the summer of 2021, China sparked great alarm in Washington when it tested hypersonic missiles. Some in the United States even feared that this test was another Sputnik moment. General Mark Milley, chairman of the United States Joint Chiefs of Staff, denied that the test was a Sputnik equivalent, but said it was very close to that. How real is this fear? What does the nuclear balance of power between the United States and China look like? If the unthinkable happened, what could a nuclear confrontation between the two look like? Let's begin. China has grown immensely wealthy over the last few decades, especially since it joined the World Trade Organization in 2001, and Beijing has used large portions of its enriched coffers in the drive to create a world-class military capable of competing with the United States. China's naval and air capabilities have increased enormously, but Beijing is now keen to share the love with its nuclear forces as well. China was one of the recognized powers in the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, which went into effect in 1970. However, it had always had a limited nuclear capability compared to the true nuclear superpowers of the time, the United States and the Soviet Union. It had few ways of delivering nuclear weapons beyond ICBM launchers and silos, and had a small number of active warheads. That has begun to change at a rapid pace in the last couple of years. In 2020, the United States estimated that China had a little more than 200 nuclear warheads. By the end of 2022, however, China had doubled that number. If Beijing continues its nuclear buildup at this pace, it could have about 1,500 nuclear warheads by 2035. However, China is not only building up the number of warheads at its disposal, but the means of delivering them. In 2021, China appeared to be building 200 new nuclear missile silos in its Gansu and Xinjiang provinces. However, China understands that these silos are easy targets, so it's also building more road-mobile ICBMs, new ballistic missile submarines, and new bomber-delivered nuclear weapons. In other words, China is trying to create an effective nuclear triad of its own in a bid to protect its nuclear capability and, if need be, enhance its offensive nuclear potential. China completed the triad with its deployment of the nuclear-capable Zhanhong-6 bomber in 2020. Meanwhile, China conducted 135 ballistic missile tests in 2021, more than every other country in the world combined. The biggest buzz, though, went to its hypersonic test that summer. The July 2021 test featured a hypersonic missile that encircled the world before hitting its target. It flew for a total of 40,000 kilometers, 
the longest flight of any Chinese land attack weapon on record. At this point, it's always important to clear away some of the cobwebs. Hypersonic missiles, projectiles capable of exceeding Mach 5, are not new. Traditional ICBMs have long exceeded these speeds. What would make China's 2021 weapon new is its combination of a fractional orbital bombardment system FOBS, with a hypersonic glide vehicle HGV. A FOBS works by flying into low Earth orbit to an altitude of about 240 kilometers. This allows the device to remain below the line of sight of radar systems designed to pick up the arc of traditional ballistic missiles. Then, before completing a full orbit, the FOBS turns around and performs a retrograde engine burn, slowing its speed so that it will intersect with its designated target. The end result is that a FOBS can strike from an unexpected direction. For example, a missile launched to low orbit over Antarctica can turn around and hit Alaska. The Soviet Union experimented with these systems in the 1970s, but work on FOBs was abandoned after the SALT II treaty banned them and Soviet submarines became more capable of launching ballistic missiles. China is interested in picking up where the Soviet Union left off, however. Beijing partially sees this as a necessity thanks to greater American investment in missile defense systems following its withdrawal from the 1972 Anti-Ballistic Missile Treaty in 2002. The second component of the system, the HGV, makes the FOBs even more unpredictable. Glide vehicles differ from traditional weapons in how they move toward their targets. Traditional ballistic missiles come at a fast but predictable arc. HGVs ride up to orbit, descend, and glide through the atmosphere to reach their targets. An HGV is able to maneuver, roll, or even pull up on re-entry to re-exit the atmosphere and then enter it again. Through these devices, an HGV can alter its trajectory while maintaining hypersonic velocities, making it fast and hard for missile defense systems to predict. China claimed that this test was of a space plane, not a weapons system, but this was a clever response. It exposes the overlap between space vehicles and these types of weapon systems. The hypersonic missile missed its target by about two dozen miles. This is of little comfort if such a weapon were to carry a strategic nuclear warhead, however. The test also raised alarms about an intelligence failure, as US officials realized that China's advancement in hypersonic weapons was further along than they once thought. Potentially, China could send this new weapon on a trajectory over the South Pole. The weapon could then turn around and glide towards American targets, because American missile defense systems are focused on trajectories over the North Pole, which is the route that Soviet ballistic missiles would have taken during the Cold War. The new Chinese weapon would leave the United States particularly vulnerable. China's moves are intended to even the playing field in a dangerous game where it had long lagged behind. The United States has the world's second-largest nuclear arsenal with 5,224 warheads. The United States currently deploys some of its nuclear weapons to five other nations – Turkey, Italy, Belgium, Germany, and the Netherlands. The forward deployment reduces the risk that America's ability for nuclear retaliation will be wiped out in an enemy first strike. It also gives the United States greater ability to launch nuclear attacks of its own. American nuclear warheads were once deployed to Japan and South Korea but have since been removed. If nuclear tensions were to escalate with China, it's probable the United States would redeploy those weapons there, something the late Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe suggested could be a necessity given the current situation in the region although he only made this suggestion after his premiership had concluded. The United States is regarded as being behind China and Russia in the deployment of hypersonic technology. There have also been major alarms about the state of America's nuclear triad in the last decade. Most of the weapons and delivery systems are many decades old. For example, the land-based part of the nuclear triad consists of about 400 LGM-30G Minuteman III missiles. This weapon system began development in 1964 and entered service in 1970. It's currently the only land-based ICBM in the United States military, and the Air Force plans to use it into the 2030s. Some of the United States land-based ICBM systems are so old that until 2019 they used 1970s-era floppy disks as part of the command and control system. Other parts of the IT system are as old. While this has the advantage of not being vulnerable to cyber warfare, it also means the system is expensive to maintain as modern engineers are unfamiliar with it, and the Air Force has increasingly needed to rely on costly civilian specialists to maintain the old architecture. The United States maintains a significant lead over China in the realm of submarine warfare. However, its Ohio-class ballistic missile submarines are also old, 
with their plans originating in the 1970s and the first vessels being launched in the early 1980s. Meanwhile, the United States has only 20 active bombers capable of delivering nuclear weapons. Its fleet of B-1 and B-52 bombers were once capable of doing this but were altered to be conventional only in the 1990s. But these weapons platforms are also old anyway. In recent years, the United States has acknowledged that it allowed its nuclear capability to atrophy following the end of the Cold War. During the Obama administration, the United States made plans to modernize the nuclear triad, which took more concrete shape during the Trump administration. It consisted of a $1.2 trillion plan between 2017 and 2046, including $772 billion for the modernization of strategic nuclear delivery systems, $25 billion for tactical nuclear delivery systems, and $445 billion for facilities needed for the operation of the new nuclear triad. One of the primary weapons in this new arsenal will be the Minuteman III's successor, the LGM-35 Sentinel, which the Air Force plans to have ready by 2030. The Sentinel will come with new silos and a new command and control system. The United States is also working on a replacement for the Ohio-class ballistic missile submarine. This will be the Columbia-class submarine, set to launch in 2031, with 12 of the new vessels planned for construction. So important is this goal that the Navy has identified the Columbia-class submarine as its top priority program, a nod to how vital the US submarine fleet is to deterring China's ambitions. Each Columbia-class submarine will be able to carry up to 16 Trident D-5 missiles, each of which can potentially carry 12 Mark IV re-entry vehicles. Although the United States has phased out these multiple re-entry vehicles on its nuclear ballistic missile since 2014, to comply with the new START treaty with Russia, the missiles can be re-equipped with them if the need arises. China is not a member of the new START treaty. Finally, there is the coming B-21 Raider bomber, which is set to replace both the B-1 Lancer and the B-2 Spirit. The Raider was rolled out to photographers for the first time in December 22 and is scheduled to enter service in 2027 with a maiden flight expected in the remaining months of 2023. The Air Force plans to purchase up to 145 B-21s, depending on the plane's engineering and manufacturing development. As the successor of the B-2, the B-21 will be capable of delivering nuclear weapons like the B-61 and B-83 bombs. The United States has also been trying its best to catch up in the hypersonic missile race and may have closed the gap. In October 2022, the United States launched a test of several hypersonic missile components. These included communications and navigations equipment and a glide vehicle that can withstand the friction generated by moving at hypersonic velocities. The test was designed to validate aspects of the Navy's conventional prompt strike and the Army's long-range hypersonic weapons program. The Pentagon considered the tests a success. For now, these programs are only experiments, and the Pentagon has still not made a formal decision to acquire hypersonic weapons, according to the Congressional Research Service. Still, the Defense Department spent $4.7 billion on hypersonic weapons research in fiscal year 2023, up from $3.8 billion in fiscal year 2022. Adding these weapons to the United States' traditional nuclear arsenal seems inevitable. How might nuclear war break out? China officially has a no-first-use policy when it comes to nuclear weapons, even if its nuclear forces are attacked by conventional enemy forces. Only in the case of a nuclear weapons strike, officially, would China use its own nukes to retaliate. This policy started with its first nuclear test in 1964, when China declared it will never at any time or under any circumstances be the first to use nuclear weapons. This policy was reaffirmed in a classified Chinese document for the operators of China's nuclear forces, where it put repeat reminders about its no-first-use policy. However, there is skepticism in Washington. The document called The Science of Second Artillery Operations has a section concerning what Chinese nuclear forces should do if a strong military power possessing nuclear-armed missiles and an absolute advantage in high-tech conventional weapons is carrying out intense and continuous attacks against our major strategic targets and we have no good military strategy to resist the enemy. This strong military power is clearly the United States. The document suggests that Chinese nuclear forces should lower the threshold in this scenario and put its nuclear weapons on alert. This is an important distinction, because unlike the United States, China's policy has been to keep its nuclear forces off alert. Its warheads are not mated to its ICBMs, and its nuclear-armed submarines are not on continuous patrol at sea. This suggests that China takes its no-first-use policy seriously, 
by putting its nuclear forces on alert, China would hope to deter the United States from taking further military action and to not use its nuclear weapons in a potential first strike, which may be tempting as military tensions escalate given the still small size of China's nuclear arsenal in comparison to that of the United States. However, the document's addition of the notion that China could use nuclear threats to compel the United States to stop a conventional attack made Dr. Gregory Kalaki, the China project manager at the Union of Concerned Scientists, uneasy. The use of nuclear threats to stop a conventional attack can slip into escalation if conventional fighting breaks out. Within the confined and disputed waters of the South China Sea, there are many places where this can happen. It would not necessarily take something as dramatic as a Chinese invasion of Taiwan, an accidental encounter in the South China Sea, such as during one of the United States' Freedom of Navigation operations FONOPS, could be the trigger to a broader conflict via miscalculation. Close military calls between the United States and Chinese armed forces have happened during these FONOPS before, as China becomes more and more aggressive in asserting its territorial claims in the area, claims that the United States does not recognize. Suppose it's the year 2031. The United States and China are at a standoff over an attempted blockade of the South China Sea's shipping lanes to Taiwan or another American ally in the region. A FONOP leads to a protracted firefight between vessels of the United States Navy and the PLAN. If conventional conflict escalates enough, or if China's leaders consider themselves threatened enough, nuclear readiness of the like Dr. Kalaki suggested could cause further tensions and make one of the two sides believe that the other is going nuclear. For the United States, the threshold for a nuclear strike is lower than one would believe. It does not have a no-first-use policy. Authorization to use nuclear weapons can only come from the president. Critics suggest that this should be changed and that further restraints should be placed on the president. But for now, the president can authorize a nuclear strike at any time and for any reason. The only limitation to this authority would be under the laws of armed conflict. For example, if the attack would cause unnecessary humanitarian suffering, or if the attack's target is not a military necessity, the order could be disregarded. However, even in these circumstances, it's likely only that the order would be changed rather than halted. So if the president believes that China will disregard its no-first-use policy and resort to nuclear weapons in order to stop a conventional conflict between it and the United States, American nuclear weapons may take to the skies. Once conventional pressures heat up, the impetus to respond and create a nuclear first strike could become acute if the United States believes its missile defense systems will be overwhelmed or if China believes that it will lose its ability to retaliate thanks to its relatively small nuclear arsenal. Preventing this from happening would require seemingly trustworthy communication between two sides that have already been shooting at each other. How might a nuclear war go? Even with its aging triad, the current nuclear balance of power favors the United States, especially beneath the waves. The United States currently has 14 Ohio-class ballistic missile submarines. Each can carry up to 20 nuclear-armed ballistic or cruise missiles. Some of these are deployed to the contested waters in the Indo-Pacific region. If a nuclear confrontation were to break out with China, the submarines would give the United States its greatest advantage. China is far behind the United States when it comes to underwater warfare. Detecting America's nuclear-powered submarines is a tall order for China's People's Liberation Army Navy. In a nuclear confrontation, America's Ohio-class submarines would swing into action and attack important targets, such as China's Yulin Naval Base on Hainan Island, which houses its fleet of Type 094 Jin-class nuclear-powered ballistic missile submarines. In contrast to the Ohio-class, China only has four of these submarines, and the United States may hope to take one or more of them off the board by striking the base. Each Type 094 can carry 12 ballistic missiles, with a range between 7,200 and 9,000 kilometers. This would be sufficient to reach the continental United States if launched from the waters near China, but would threaten all of America's bases and allies in the region, plus Alaska and Hawaii. In a nuclear scenario, it's unlikely that all of the Type 094s would be taken out at once. Although they are louder than the Cold War-era Soviet submarines, they would likely be found before they could get into range to attack the continental United States. However, China is also working on a successor ballistic missile submarine, the Type 096, which is quieter and would be armed with new missiles with a range exceeding 9,000 kilometers. The Pentagon expects the Type 096 to be operational by 2030, further adding to China's nuclear readiness. Nuclear missile silos and bases likely to host China's mobile ballistic missile launchers 
would also be targeted by American submarines. Some of these mobile launchers may have ballistic missiles armed with nuclear-tipped HGVs. Examples would include the medium-range DF-17, with its DF-ZF HGV, which has a range between 1,800 and 2,500 kilometers. This weapon system became operational in 2019, and although it cannot reach the American mainland, it poses a serious threat to the United States bases and fleets in the region. The Ohio-class submarines would be hard for China to remove from the board. Dozens of nuclear ballistic or cruise missiles would come over Chinese airspace in an all-out attack. China has missiles capable of reaching the United States too, and America's interior nuclear bases, naval bases, and silos would come under attack. Air defense systems would destroy some of these, but any that make it through would do devastating damage, and if its hypersonic-related technology comes online, it would have greater success. Additionally, China's leaders have had a long-standing policy of targeting adversarial cities in a nuclear second strike, so even if the United States seeks to avoid civilian areas as much as possible in an attack, China probably won't. It's difficult to tell how exactly a nuclear war between the United States and China would go, except that it would be the most catastrophic confrontation ever recorded. What is clear is that China's nuclear posture is quickly changing from one of minimum deterrence to something far more offensive. The expansion in its nuclear capabilities allows China's military to be bolder in pursuing its expansionist ambitions. Before, America's nuclear superiority made it harder for China to directly challenge the international order led by the United States. That's now beginning to change, and Washington is willing to spend trillions to ensure that its biggest strategic rival does not eclipse its nuclear capability. Describing the current situation as a return to a Cold War-style nuclear arms race may be overdoing it, but one thing is certain, we are closer to that kind of confrontation than at any time since the days of the Soviet Union. What do you think about China's military buildup? How does it change the balance of power with the United States? And what would a nuclear confrontation between them look like? Don't forget to let us know in the comments and subscribe for more military analysis from military experts. If you go ahead and spin the proverbial wheel of global worry today, there's a good chance you'll land on the words China and World War III. Unfortunately, there are several reasons for that and they all lead to the question no one wants to think about. Is China getting ready for World War III? It's true that nowadays you can't go far without someone talking about the perils of Taiwanese reunification, artificial Chinese islands, Cold War 2.0, or the specifications of the latest hypersonic missile. Add to that the increasing frequency of Chinese incursions into Taiwanese airspace, Japan's recent decision to purchase hundreds of new weapons for its own defense, like these American-made Tomahawk missiles, and closer military cooperation between the US and Australia, and we are starting to see the signs of another global conflict on the horizon, one that is likely to begin somewhere in the Indo-Pacific. It all adds up to another doomsday scenario waiting in the wings, and some believe it could take place as early as 2024. Does China have a World War III plan in place, and if so, what does it look like? China's rise over the past few decades seems to indicate that the worrisome and likely answer to the first question is yes, and here's why. Tensions between China and the West have not been this high in a long time. Rewind several decades and many experts would have laughed at you if you claimed you were a time traveler from the future and China posed a serious geopolitical threat to the international order. That's because the 1990s were a strange time, and not just because of the oversized genes and kids' obsession with green slime. It was a period of untempered Western optimism. Yep, you heard that right, optimism. From our pessimism-soaked vantage point today, the geopolitical arc of that decade was almost unicorn-like, a surreal period of national unity, hope, and security with the 9-11 terrorist attacks on the Twin Towers. But for a while, things seemed, well, good. Emerging victorious from its 45-year ideological standoff with the Soviet Union, for a brief unipolar moment in time the United States enjoyed unmatched power and prestige on the global stage. There were no more near-peer threats. While terrorists and revolutionaries conspired at the peripheries of power, America's military and its coalition partners, equipped to the eyeballs with the latest technology and fresh off their rollicking victory in the Persian Gulf, bought into the idea that democracy was spreading and would continue to do so with assistance and persistence around the globe. It was in this geopolitical climate 
minute that things really started to change for China, not that many Western observers really noticed. Between 1949 and 1971, it had existed behind the Bamboo Curtain, a totalitarian dictatorship under the authoritarian communist revolutionary Mao Zedong. Things changed when the United States sought rapprochement with China in the 1970s, thereafter reopening diplomatic relations and turning China into a willing Cold War partner through strengthening economic relationships and a degree of exposure to the West it had not enjoyed since World War II. China started modernizing a lot. Americans profited, China grew. As China grew, Americans hoped the exposure to Western values and ideas would liberalize and democratize China. There were social and cultural reforms amid the modernization, yes, but not many. China's benign growth lulled the West into a false sense of security. Some pundits argue that it was in the 1990s, the heyday of American optimism, that China started really playing the long game, hatching a secret 50-year plan to achieve the great rejuvenation of the Chinese nation after a century of downturns. Entangling its economy with the United States, it grew fast enough to convince the the West it deserved a place in the World Trade Organization, the WTO, something it achieved by the early 2000s. Yes, we will play by the rules of international order, Chinese leaders proclaimed, with enough zeal to make their Western partners proud. It was around then its economy started booming, growing almost 10% every year for the next two decades. Between 1980 and 2000, its GDP quadrupled. Starting at under $90 billion in 1980, it now hovers around $13 trillion, the fastest growing increase in human history. Hundreds of millions of Chinese residents were lifted out of poverty as the country's economic potential skyrocketed. As globalization continued and China received hundreds of billions of dollars of global investment, it established a trade footprint to rival much of the rest of the world, providing cheap labor that built most of the products now adorning your home while becoming competitive in cutting-edge cyber, space, and technology sectors. It has long since become East Asia's economic titan par excellence. It thrived under the auspices of global capitalism. It took on some of the trappings of the West, especially in its its business and trade practices, but it never really democratized. To this day, it maintains its communist, centralized authoritarian regime under the singular vision of its latest ruler, Xi Jinping, and Xi has a vision all right. Having covertly flourished under the umbrella of American power for several decades, China is now preparing the next phase of its grand strategy to catapult itself into the realm of peerless global hegemon, one that can impose itself in its Indo-Pacific neighborhood at will while projecting enough global influence to shape the rules-based international order in its own image. It's taken them 14 five-year plans to get to that point, but they've finally arrived. Now China wants to build a community of common destiny, essentially a nice way of saying it wants to coercively achieve what it views the US doing all over the world, leading international organizations, becoming a political and economic model for developing countries, being able to project world-class military power all across the globe, all while leveraging its trade relationships, allies, and partners to achieve its interests, aka replace the United States as the world's leading state. They chose 2049 for the date to achieve all of this, the centenary of the founding of the People's Republic of China PRC. But each successive milestone for modernization has amped up the tension between China and the West. National security insiders have been sounding alarm bells for a decade now, but only recently have things started to get real. Over the past three decades, China has spent its way to military might. In 2019, it was spending more than South Korea, Japan, India, Russia, and Taiwan combined, accounting for over half of Asian GDP and half of all Asian military expenditures. China didn't have to just outspend their competition, however. Over the past decade, a growing number of Western defense officials have started kicking themselves for not realizing the pitfalls of economic interdependence with China. It's been no secret that for decades, Chinese spies have been stealing valuable intellectual property, including US military secrets. Just look at their latest stealth fighter, the J-20. It's a surreal mashup of the latest stealth technology, the type you might get if an American F-22, F-35, and a Russian MiG-144 walked into a bar, had one too many, and started spilling their secrets within earshot of a Chinese spy. China has stolen immense amounts of data too, some we unwittingly give them by opting in to use Chinese-owned platforms like TikTok, data that US officials claim gives them enough personal information to identify potential targets for intelligence collection and other subterfuge. Just like the West can and probably does, China uses this data to geo locate top national security targets, recruit spies, conduct massive remote cyber attacks, and steal military and technology secrets. The issue isn't just that China has shiny new advanced submarines, missiles, aircrafts, 
drones, and other toys to play with, it is that it's now looking like it has the logistics, infrastructure, and know-how to use them effectively, and that's something we need to explore further. As we all know, nation-states can't just fling military power around the globe willy-nilly. You have to have the national industrial base to build up your power, the domestic support to use it, the transport infrastructure to move it, agreements in place to base it, and an effective doctrine and strategy to employ it. It took the United States four years of total war and victory in two theaters to emerge as a bona fide global superpower after World War II. Were it not for the destabilization in the aftermath of that war and the exigencies of the Cold War that followed it, it would not have many of the military basing agreements or the alliances and partnerships it now enjoys around the world today. Many of those relationships and the infrastructure sustaining them took decades, even generations, to build. And today, that is something we often take for granted. But not China. They know the price of obscurity and the difficulty of restoring national power and prestige back to superpower levels. Their long-term strategy, in part, is to achieve the same degree of global agency that the United States enjoys. It too wants bases for its military all over the world, flourishing economic relationships and safe trade routes for its commercial fleet. Without a world war to create the conditions for its rise to power, China has had to engineer its rise artificially, partially through guile and subterfuge, partially using state-sponsored initiatives that scream, we are trying to go global and we will make it happen whether you like it or not. One of China's global projects that stands out from the rest in terms of ambition, scale, and significance, the One Belt Road Initiative, or Belt and Road Initiative, BRI. Much like the ancient Silk Road that connected Chinese traders and goods with rich foreign markets, the BRI strives to achieve the same degree of global influence for China in the modern era. To understand China, you have to grapple with the BRI. Many analysts view the project as China's answer to the Marshall Plan, a post-World War II economic assistance package that sought to revitalize war-torn Europe. Unlike the Marshall Plan, the BRI is extended to any willing economic partner. Formal agreements between China the host nation to build economic and political ties generally precede a litany of Chinese investment, funding, infrastructure projects, tech collaboration, and more. In the process, China gets access to ports and airfields, markets for state-owned companies, safeguards for international trade, and international influence. For years, the BRI has been the litmus test for global Chinese power projection. The belt connects China with Europe and the other dozen nations on its borders via a series of overland trade routes, while the road refers to its maritime interests, fueling stations, ports, industry, infrastructure scattered throughout Southeast Asia and the Indian Ocean. A great example of periphery diplomacy, BRI projects can now be found from the Himalayas to the Horn of Africa and Mediterranean Basin. It has funded infrastructure deals in Malaysia, gas pipelines and railroads in Nigeria, Egypt, Ethiopia and Kenya, maintains port operations in Greece, projects in Sri Lanka and has other projects in the works. The West has viewed the BRI warily. Some criticize China's debt trap diplomacy, a tactic of luring economically vulnerable states into taking out Chinese loans and then jacking up the rates to unpayable levels as a form of coercion over the government in question. Others fear China's growing telecommunications and economic influence over Europe and the global south, but there still hasn't been a really unified response, and China continues to shovel money into its initiative, with another $124 billion pledged in 2017. One of the big warning signs came that same year, when China decided to establish a hub in Djibouti, a developing nation strategically located in the Gulf of Aden on the whole of Africa. China had essentially said it would never open an official military base there, and then they did, calling it a logistics facility, even though PLA Navy Marines and other forces regularly mull about with armored vehicles and artillery. It is considering similar projects in Cambodia, Myanmar, Thailand, Singapore, Indonesia, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, United Arab Emirates, Kenya, Seychelles, Tanzania, Angola, and Tajikistan, evidence of China's expanding military footprint around the globe. These military bases hold great potential for regional destabilization. Such developments are a warning that countries can become unwitting partners to PRC military expansion by giving China access to airfields and ports it would otherwise lack. A global footprint, therefore, is a prerequisite for China's national rejuvenation and has certainly empowered its actions at home. Maritime disputes in the waters around China are so common they've almost become normalized. These waters in the South China Sea are heavily trafficked, including some of the richest shipping lanes in the world. Xi Jinping made a promise not to militarize certain islands China artificially built in the South China Sea. Now the Parcel and Spratly Islands are militarized and can be used to intimidate and coerce coastal states throughout the region. The bullying continues in the East China Sea as Chinese merchant vessels regularly dominate lucrative shipping lanes. Coast Guard, military, and commercial ships deprive foreign fishermen of access to resources, and policymakers make ambitious maritime claims that are are frequently rejected as lacking basis in international law. For the record, territorial waters are considered up to 12 nautical miles off a country's coastline, a fact China ignores. 
China wants to monopolize the natural gas, oil, and hydrocarbon reserves it feels it has a claim to, even hundreds of miles away. A lot of the tension arises near the Senkaku Islands, a group of uninhabited islands that in 1971 reverted back to Japanese administrative control under the Okinawa Reversion Agreement. Over these seas, China has set out to create air defense identification zones, increasing its operational reach even further. Taken together, China's economic and cultural influence combined with its renewed military strength add up into a scary equation for Beijing's neighbors. There have also been regular border conflicts on the China-India frontier since a PRC-instigated clash in 2020 left dozens dead. India claims China has the onus to withdraw. And they haven't. South Korea is worried about North Korea, China's only major Asian ally, doing something stupid. Even Japan, you know, those guys who were so committed to pacifism after World War II that they called their military a self-defense force, are now so alarmed they're arming themselves with hundreds of Tomahawk missiles, writing counter-strike capabilities into their fighting doctrine, and conducting joint military exercises with American and Australian forces, an image that surely would have made our grandparents both proud and perplexed. And nobody should be more scared than Taiwan. The small independent island nation will almost undoubtedly be ground zero in any World War III scenario with China. Here's why. China is bent on reuniting Taiwan with mainland China. The spat goes back to World War II, when nationalist rebels fled to the island and created a vibrant democratic society, one China refuses to acknowledge or respect. Ever since, China has wanted Taiwan back more than a prepubescent teen who accidentally traded their holographic first edition Charizard for a bag of potato chips. And this is a problem, since the United States has all but formally pledged to intervene and protect Taiwan in the event China decides to invade. And boy has it probably thought about it. In August 2022, the China State Council produced a white paper whose table of contents made China's position on the issue explicitly clear. Chapter 1. Taiwan is part of China. This is an indisputable fact. Chapter 2. Resolute efforts of the CCP to realize China's complete reunification. Chapter 3. China's complete reunification is a process that cannot be halted. Chapter 4. National reunification in a new era. Chapter 5. Bright prospects for a peaceful reunification. It's okay, you can tell us how you really feel, Beijing. We are one China, the paper alleges, and Taiwan is part of China. This is an indisputable fact supported by history and the law. Taiwan has never been a state. Its status as part of China is unalterable. The CPC is committed to the historic mission of resolving the Taiwan question and realizing China's complete reunification. So China is overwhelmingly focused on reunifying Taiwan. They say they won't use force. Hmm. Where have we heard that before? Authoritarian leader claims he won't use force to reunify territory he believes is rightfully his. But hey, this type of tension has been brewing since the 1996 Taiwan Strait Crisis, when the PRC had a showdown with an American carrier group after conducting a bunch of missile tests in the Taiwan Strait. The outcome of the Taiwan issue has real global bearings. Taiwan is the epicenter of the global semiconductor industry. What's a semiconductor, you say? Anything that has an electronic chip. Your phone, your computer, your wireless modem, your electronic toys, your average ballistic missile, medical instruments, televisions, cutting-edge satellites, they all rely on semiconductors for computing. It is a $556 billion industry, one that for better or for worse hinges on the whims of a Taiwan-China-US love triangle. You see, the US sells 46% of global semiconductors, but only manufactures 12% of them. China consumes the most, importing $378 billion worth and putting what it buys into 35% of the world's devices. And Taiwan, as you might expect, has 53% of the global semiconductor market share and produces 90% of the world's most advanced ones you might see in cars, smartphones, and military tech. That's a serious share of the market. Interdependence is a problem. The US is now trying to decouple itself from the Taipei-Beijing chip drama and become self-sufficient. But Taiwan's predominance on the global chip market is one reason Beijing literally cannot afford to let Taiwan continue to independently exist. It needs to set the terms of trade in the region, not Taiwan and other Western-facing nations. Otherwise, it will always be seen as a second-rate power. What does this all amount to? Well, this situation has produced the worst security crisis in the Taiwan Strait in 20 years. China means business. As Taiwan becomes more eager to carve out its independence from the mainland, China views its very sovereign existence as an existential threat. China worries about being hamstrung behind the first island chain, a series of nations that includes the Philippines, Borneo, Japan, and the Ryukyu Islands, that it fears can contain and limit its ability to project power beyond its shores. Taiwan one is at the heart of this island chain, 
a cornerstone of Western power in the region, one that perpetually transmits dangerously subversive messages of Western-backed prosperity while it remains independent. With Taiwan under America's orbit, it is a thorn in Xi's side. With a reunified Taiwan, China gains the ability to break the first island chain and wield influence deep into the Pacific. Predictably, China is throwing caution to the wind regarding Taiwan's territorial sovereignty, violating Taiwan's Air Defense Identification Zone ADIS, and the median line dividing the Taiwan Strait once considered as an invisible barrier between the two entities with frightful regularity. Between 1954 and 2020, there were only four Chinese violations of these internationally recognized demarcations. In 2020 alone, there were 380. There were more than double that number the following year with 969 incursions. The biggest came on October 4, 2021, a day that saw 56 aircraft enter Taiwan's air defense zone, unironically coinciding with China's National Day of Celebration. By May of this year, there had been a 50% increase in the number of incursions over the same span in 2021. Partially to send a supportive signal in response, the US conducted a series of high-profile political visits to the island. China didn't buy it. To them, the visits were needlessly escalatory. They responded with more overflights, setting a new record for monthly sorties. Since the the summer, the PLA Air Force PLAF, has flown over 1,000 sorties near Taiwan, 40% of them in the ADIS or over the median line. Today, it is coming into Taiwanese airspace on a near-daily basis, ramping up its intimidation efforts around Taiwan in other ways too, from anti-submarine warfare, drone reconnaissance, and cyber attacks to the growth of its naval and missile presence in the region. China's end goal is clear. Taiwan has voiced alarm and concern over the near-constant encirclement drills, labeling them as escalatory equivalent of a sea and air block of the island. If these are, in fact, dress rehearsals for a full-scale invasion, China will continue to ramp up the pressure as the time goes on. The on-ramp to war, then, is there, and it's volatile. Some pundits compare the existing slate of geopolitical relationships in the Indo-Pacific to the entangled alliance systems in Europe on the eve of World War I. This is, at least, a line of reasoning. Hal Brands, a prominent political scientist at John Hopkins University, has espoused comparing Japanese, Australian, and American collaboration as a latter-day triple entente the pre-World War coalition that sought to contain Imperial Germany in the Western Pacific. It didn't take much for the World War I powder keg to erupt in the Balkans, fueling a chain reaction that resulted in the First World War. If history is any guide, it won't take much to escalate a regional clash in the Indo-Pacific into a global war either. It is here in Asia's maritime heartland where all the ingredients of a global cataclysm are conspiring against the post-Cold War period of peace and stability in the Indo-Pacific, one analyst observed. It's also here where the naked edge of China's hegemonic ambitions are on full display, with dire consequences for smaller neighbors and the broader liberal international order. Here lies the defining geopolitical dilemma of our times. Well put, so how are the major players gearing up to play their part? We've already talked about China, at least their geopolitical maneuvering. Militarily, they've been following the same path, modernizing at an impressive rate to add bite to their bark as they pursue their strategy of recasting the global governance system in its own image. Its to-do list has, so far, taken a page right out of a America's playbook, China has adopted the model that made America powerful, first building a moderately prosperous society in all respects, then using that as a foundation to build a truly competitive, world-class military. The fusion of civil military power is deliberate. Industrial developments in quantum computing, AI, robotics, and biotechnology not only help China become competitive in the civilian sphere, these technologies can be appropriated to help the Chinese network their military forces. And make no mistake, this is something it is eagerly doing. To create a state-of-the-art air force, it has set a goal to fully network its combined and joint chains of command by 2027. Advancing dual-use technologies, ones that can benefit civilian and military infrastructure alike, will enable rapid information exchange between its army, navy, air, rocket, and yes, even space forces. Easily setting the Chinese military apart from anything America's nearest peer, the Russians have been able to achieve in Ukraine if they succeed. For a while now, the CCP has portrayed a West in relative decline. This narrative fuels Beijing's hopes it can supplant the United States as the preeminent global superpower. And to be fair, things in the United States haven't been all that peachy over the past decade or so. Race riots, populism, rampant misinformation and fake news, capital uprisings, COVID, political polarization, mistrust, and fear have exposed internal fractures and brought American democracy to its weakest point in generations. But America has been gearing up for its marathon clash against China for years now, in the hopes that if things did spill over into a full-scale war, it would be ready. America American leaders, regardless of political party, are now mostly unified on this. They know the coming struggle will be ideological and cultural as much as it will be an in-and-out technological, economic, and military competition. Still, it wasn't really until 2018 
2018 that the United States officially changed its strategic posture to address China's rise. At the tail end of two fruitless decades in the Middle East, its national strategy shifted to recognize China, not terrorists or Russia, as the main peer adversary. This year, the Biden administration updated its national security strategy but did not depart from the rhetoric or strategic competition that pervaded earlier iterations. American strategy emphasizes this as the decisive decade to get ahead and win the competition for the 21st century. Some people criticize American strategy for reviving antiquated Cold War mentalities, painting over Soviet tropes with Chinese skins in another zero-sum adversarial competition that could needlessly escalate into war. Vastly different political systems aside, there are more similarities than differences between China and the United States than there were between the US and the Soviet Union, especially in the realm of economics. The two competing powers are not mutually exclusive, but disagreements and mistrust are common enough destabilizers that many fear the status quo can't be maintained for long. China is aware that it still cannot compete with the United States in many areas. The United States Navy, for instance, though technically smaller than the Chinese Navy, continues to patrol strategic waterways in the Indo-Pacific, ensuring vital sea lanes remain open for free and flourishing international trade. American carrier groups have bases throughout the first island chain. American submarines and aircraft tend to be more robust, possessing longer range and better stealth technology than their Chinese counterparts. Chinese jet engines are not as advanced as American ones. Its military suffers quality control issues with its imbalanced admixture of antiquated and modern military systems and vehicles. Its logistics and transport capabilities lag far behind their globe-trotting American adversary. And above all, the Chinese lack concrete fighting experience, having fought and lost their last major operation in Vietnam in 1979. Experience the United States coming off its own unfortunate Middle Eastern odyssey nevertheless has in spades. But the PLA's military strategy is catered to overcome these shortcomings. In a World War III scenario, especially one involving Taiwan, the United States, its allies and partners, namely Japan, South Korea, Singapore, the Philippines, and possibly India, would have to operate in China's neck of the woods at the tail end of an incredibly long logistics network. The United States' geographic location makes it reliant on small overseas bases refueling tankers, transport vehicles, and carriers to convey and sustain its units abroad. While China continues modernizing its forces and develops its own expeditionary capabilities, it has developed an anti-access area denial A2AD, strategy to keep America and its allies at bay in the Indo-Pacific. The strategy has seen China prioritize the construction of a bristling array of ground-based missiles, naval assets, and aircraft equipped with the latest air-to-air -air and air-to-ground missiles that can outrange their American counterparts and thus discourage them from intervening in a regional conflict. This active defense strategy will make American intervention in Taiwan both risky and potentially deadly. Is all of this really leading to a future world war? Most security experts will be the first to tell you that the war against China is anything but inevitable. If both powers can learn to manage their competitive relationship, they can peacefully coexist despite their adversarial posture. But wars can ignite from inauspicious sources. As Peter Warren Singer, a strategist and senior fellow at a think tank called New America and award-winning author, has written, in the coming decades, a war might ignite accidentally, such as by two opposing warships trading paint near a reef not even marked on a nautical chart, or it could slow burn and erupt as a reordering of the global system in the late 2020s, a period at which China's military buildup is on pace to match the US. Singer has spent a lot of time thinking about the type of war we might expect in the Pacific. The war, he argues, will be a multi-domain conflict, meaning it will transpire in the traditional domains of air, sea, and land, as well as futuristic domains like space. The lifeblood of modern military communications and cyber, where digital military systems and civilian infrastructure may be prone to attack. The United States has not waged a multi-domain war against a peer adversary since 1945, and so many of the lessons it learned in Iraq and Afghanistan may not be as relevant to a war with China. Likewise, America's traditional approach to wars has been to overmatch its enemies, relying on military technology at least one generation ahead to produce qualitative advantages on the battlefield. US forces can't count on overmatch in the future, Singer argues, since much of America's intellectual property has been stolen outright by Chinese spies, while its R&D has been accelerating its experimentation with space, drone, hypersonic, and cyber technologies. Still, experimentation is not the same as full-scale acquisition and implementation. China's two biggest vulnerabilities are historically significant, that it is reliant on imported semiconductors and microchips, things it cannot produce itself, and second, that it is heavily reliant on imported oil. The situation is not unlike Japan's in the early 20th century. A rapidly modernizing imperial power with a plucky navy totally reliant on oil imports to sustain itself. As it started to expand into China and the Pacific, seeking access to raw resources, the United States embarked the export of oil and other military 
goods. Pearl Harbor, the start of the last war for the United States fought in the Pacific, came in part because Japanese leaders viewed the war with the United States as inevitable. It needed an independent oil supply, something it would seek in the oil-rich Dutch East Indies, and it knew if it attacked, the US would come knocking, so it needed to prevent its own geopolitical encirclement by striking a knockout blow on the American fleet, then stationed at Pearl Harbor. It had a narrow window, given its limited oil reserves at home, and so they attacked. Some say another Pearl Harbor is brewing, this time with Taiwan at the epicenter. Reunifying the island by force will give China access to the semiconductors it needs, but it would have to ensure that the United States could not meaningfully intervene. Toshi Yoshihara, a China expert who works at the Center for Strategic and Budgetary Assessment, has warned that the PLA's views on a Pacific conflict are consistent with Pearl Harbor, and that they are predisposed to delivering a decisive first blow against US-deployed forces in the Western Pacific, particularly those in Japan. Chinese doctrine indeed emphasizes surprise at the outset of war, all part of a counter-intervention strategy to keep the Beijing, Tianjin, Shanghai, Nanjing, Guangzhou, Shenzhen corridor open. Its precision strike arsenal, primarily made up of DF-21C missiles, are capable of hitting any target on the entire Japanese archipelago, while its DF-26 missiles can fire conventional and nuclear warheads almost 4,000 kilometers, far enough to strike the strategic US base at Guam. In all likelihood, if it were to spring an amphibious invasion of Taiwan, China's tactic would be to saturate America's roving carrier groups and their escorts with waves of ballistic anti-ship missiles, overcome their defenses, and send billions of dollars of valuable equipment to the bottom of the ocean before it can be brought to bear. This would help overcome the early gulf in military shipping, aircraft, and tonnage between the two sides. They would then target vulnerable American sensor aircraft, refueling tankers and cargo ships to curtail America's ability to get close to Chinese territory. The United States has far more battle force missiles than the Chinese, meaning the total number of missiles capable of being fired in combat before resupply, but the Chinese do have enough to saturate and destroy three American carrier groups simultaneously, potentially turning the American naval forces in the Pacific into a moot point before a war begins. There is even evidence that they have been practicing such preemptive strikes in the Gobi Desert in western China. Such a move might be good in the short term, but short-term tactical victories do not win wars. China would then have to contend with the galvanization of American morale, the mobilization of its entire economy for war, and the possibility of intervention from many of its regional and global partners, one of whom is Japan, the world's third largest economy with a powerful navy of its own. If China went to war, it would be anything but subtle. For an operation that big in the 21st century, it's almost impossible to achieve the element of surprise. Observers would see a flurry of activity in China's eastern and southern theater commands opposite at Taiwan for weeks and even months prior to invasion, ports of embarkation, airfields, field hospitals, and mobile command posts buzzing, units deploying with oil and gas pipelines, transport ships loading, commercial ships looking to provoke and escalate. The forces far from Taiwan would be placed on high alert. National mobilization efforts would increase, and the military would begin commandeering civilian vessels, ferries, aircrafts, trucks, and trains. China would have to surge its production of ballistic long-range missiles and cruise missiles for a massive anti-air, anti-ship, air-to-air, and beach bombardment. It would need to achieve a degree of economic self-sufficiency in anticipation for the sanctions that would undoubtedly be implemented. It would be a lot like what we saw in Ukraine with Russian forces massing on the border, not unlike a classic game of risk. You mass on your enemy's border, you claim you come in peace, you are only there to defend yourself, you claim. Meanwhile, battle plans are circulating, and you are one move away from starting World War III. What's next? Unlike the Japanese at Pearl Harbor who failed to authorize a third strike to neutralize the American carrier and submarine fleet, the Chinese would have to find a way to continually pressure the Americans in the Pacific to deter further intervention. Making it so prohibitively costly, its morale and will to assist Taiwan would crumble. An invasion of Taiwan would be tantamount to Germany's invasion of the Rhineland in 1936. Unless the West is willing to stand up and deter Chinese aggression from the start, an invasion could spark emergency rearmament programs, mass mobilization, and quickly escalate into a global war. War. She and the CCP are no fools, however. They know it would be a Rubicon moment if they were to invade Taiwan, something they could never walk back from. They will have been watching Putin's adventure in Ukraine with great interest, observing firsthand how aggressive regional land grabs can spiral into an out-and-out, no-holds-barred contest against deceptively capable nations with Western backing. They know if they act, they will immediately forfeit their national image abroad and become international pariahs. In the end, China will have to figure out what ultimate victory would look like and if it will be worth the price of an all-out war. The ball is already in their court, reunifying Taiwan by force is a massive obstacle. Overturning an entire global order is even harder by an order of magnitude. Could China do it? Is war really inevitable? Let us know in the comments, and don't forget to subscribe for more military analysis from military experts. With the amount of lethal aid that the US is delivering to Ukraine, 
to help defend themselves against the ongoing Russian invasion, it's logical to ask, could the US conquer Russia on its own? To answer that, we need to take a closer look at both countries' militaries, compare their strengths and weaknesses, and get clear on who is the bravest and the baddest armed force out there. Starting off with a deep dive, let's talk about nuclear power. Here's the thing. We need to accept that comparing US and Russian military power will have to exclude the use of nuclear weapons by either side. Why? Well, the US and Russia have roughly equal parity in nuclear warheads, with reportedly 5,900 total operational nuclear warheads for Russia and 5,400 for the US. Included in these stockpiles, yep, it's a tie. Russia and the US each have about 1,600 active, deployed, strategic nuclear warheads. However, these numbers are just best guesses, since neither country will confirm nor deny their active nuclear forces, and only rarely will they confirm where such weapons are being kept. It's scary to be kept in the dark on this topic, right? Well, it gets scarier. Apparently, Russia claims to have a working dead hand system in place, also known as the perimeter system, that will automatically launch Russia's nuclear forces if an attempted first strike is launched to decapitate Russian leadership. While this system is supposed to be offline under normal circumstances, it's not clear when Russia has this system set to on. It's quite likely that since 2014, during Russia's earlier invasion of eastern Ukraine and the Crimean Peninsula, this system may have been continually online, in order to prevent a decapitating first strike by US forces. It gets worse. Putin apparently placed Russia's entire nuclear forces on high alert in February of 2022, following the invasion of Ukraine and NATO and the West's response to support the defenders. There is no indication that the high alert status has been revoked. In fact, as of March 29, 2023, President Putin has announced that Russia will no longer give advanced warning of their nuclear weapons tests, following their February announcement that they would no longer allow the US to inspect their nuclear weapons sites as part of the decades-old START weapons treaty. With all these unsettling red flags in place, let's shift gears and take a look at other aspects of the US and Russian militaries. Who do you think has the best army, budget, and weaponry? The short answer is, there really is no comparison. The US military is currently vastly superior to anything Russia can muster. Everything we've seen from the invasion of Ukraine so far shows that the Russian army, navy, and air force have been completely overrated by Western analysts and have been manhandled expertly by Ukraine's outnumbered but valiant defenders. What's left of Russia's once vaunted military is being chewed up faster than they can replace them. But it wasn't always this way. During the Cold War, the Soviet Union and the US had roughly equal conventional forces, at least in numbers. The USSR had an advantage in raw numbers of tanks and artillery, especially in the areas bordering Western Europe and its NATO member countries, while the US had a larger and more advanced air force, navy, and special forces. But since the breakup of the Soviet Union in 1991, the two sides have grown steadily and dramatically apart. In terms of the sophistication of their tanks and aircraft, the reliability of their state-of-the-art weapon systems, and their respective capability to project power into other regions and spheres of influence. For example, Russia currently has only one working aircraft carrier, an older, fuel-oil-burning ship launched in 1985 named the Admiral Kuznetsov, which, oddly enough, was built in Ukraine. This ship has suffered a string of serious accidents, from shipboard fires to repair cranes falling on its flight deck during repairs. When it does travel, it never sails far from its home port without a seagoing tug to tow it back home. It isn't even in current deployment, having been in different dry docks undergoing continual repairs since 2018, and it's known to leave an incredibly dark trail of dense smoke due to an inability for its boilers to fully burn its low-grade fuel. The whole ship is an embarrassment to the world's navies, yet it's the largest capital ship Russia still has afloat, so they'll do anything to try and keep it going. You might see it back on the high seas in 2024, maybe. In comparison, the United States is completing its second carrier in the Ford class, the most advanced and largest aircraft carrier class in the world. The US Navy currently operates 11 carrier strike groups, each of which is built around a nuclear-powered carrier. Each of these strike groups incorporates multiple ships that includes Aegis-class carriers, nuclear-powered attack submarines, destroyers, minesweepers, and additional support and resupply ships. Each Ford-class carrier will be able to support more than 75 aircraft, including the latest fifth-generation aircraft, the F-35C, along with state-of-the-art drones, airborne warning, and surveillance aircraft. 
These carrier strike groups allow the US to patrol the world's oceans and project air power far from the US mainland. Russia has no equivalent capability and likely never will. The same inequality exists in their respective air forces and it's only widening. While the US has both the F-35 and F-22 fifth-generation stealth fighters, Russia's only close to but not quite fifth-gen fighter, the Su-57, can't deploy over Ukraine for fear of being shot down. Meanwhile, the US is already making progress on the NGAD, the next-generation air dominance system, which includes new weapons, advanced sensors, networking and battle management suites, redesigned jet engines and innovative combat drones that will be designed around a truly groundbreaking 6th gen fighter to replace the F-22, which, even though it's being replaced, still remains the best dogfighting combat aircraft in operation. The US Navy is also working on a 6th gen carrier-based stealth fighter under the current program name FAXX. Prototypes may already be flying and the current Navy budget has already earmarked over $9 billion in funding for further development. On the other side of the equation, Russia claims to be working on a 5th Gen++ fighter, the Mikoyan Pak dp also known as the MiG-41. But so far it barely exists in reduced-sized wind tunnel mock-ups and may not be seen as a flying prototype until sometime in the mid-2030s. Then there are the respective tank forces. The US Abrams tank may not be the world's best, some argue that spot is taken up by the Israeli Makava, the German Leopard 2 or the British Challenger 2 but the Abrams has been battle-tested since the first Gulf War in 1990 and has been continually upgraded and improved. Currently, the Abrams M1A2 System Enhancement Package version 4, SEP version 4, will employ third-generation 3-gen FLIR, forward-looking infrared advanced optics that allow tank commanders to identify and attack targets farther away than ever before. Of course, Russian fanboys will point to the much-vaunted T-14 Armata as the best tank in the world, Except, well, where to begin? The tank was designed around the A85-3 engine, a copy of an X-shaped German engine which was never designed for tank propulsion. The tank's electronics and computer controls suffer from a lack of advanced computer chips, which under Western sanctions has been a real Achilles heel for the Russian economy. Captured Russian drones show they are so desperate for computer chips that they've resorted to using stolen Swedish traffic cameras for their guts. Without a consistent supply of computer chips, there's no way Russia can mass-produce the Armata. That wasn't bad enough. The production company for the Armata, UVZ, is busy upgrading previously mothballed T-62s and supporting the overworked T-72B3 and T-90M assembly lines. Currently, any Armatas being assembled are being done by hand. By hand. That may work for limited production Rolls Royces and Lamborghinis, but it doesn't bode well for the implementation of a mass-produced battlefield weapons platform. Without any armatas in Ukraine, and with a greater reliance on more outdated and poorly retrofitted Soviet-era models, the Abrams is far and away better than the vast majority of the surviving Russian tank forces. I say surviving because as of March 2023, the Russians have lost, at a bare minimum, an astounding 1,900 main battle tanks. Everything from the upgraded but still outdated T-72s to around 58 of their more modern T-90s. This means that more than half of their country's entire pre-invasion active tank force has been destroyed or captured. And this number is only what's been positively verified by Western observers like the Oryx team of open source analysts. According to the London-based International Institute for Strategic Studies, the total could be anywhere from 20% to 40% higher. Russia is so desperate for replacement tanks that they're even bringing in not just the T-62s from their mothballed tank graveyards, but as of March 23, 2023, even some 75-year-old T-54s and 55s. That would be like the US bringing back its Korean War-era M47 and M48 patterns. The bad news doesn't stop there. Russia has also lost around 800 infantry fighting vehicles, lightly armored trucks and transports, 2,200 armored fighting vehicles like the various MBT, MBD and BTR models, 230 mobile command posts and communication units, 300 engineering vehicles, 190 towed artillery pieces, 370 self-propelled artillery, 190 multiple rocket launchers, MLRS, 100 surface-to-air systems, 2,300 unarmored transports, jeeps and other vehicles. Honestly, at this point, it's almost easier to count which tanks and vehicles Russia has left, rather than try to keep up with the ones they've lost. 
And again, all of this has happened not against NATO or the US directly, but against much smaller Ukraine, and in just over a year. The Russian Air Force, when it's deigned to make an appearance over the battlefield, has also suffered unusually high casualties. It's estimated that 6 to 8 percent of its active tactical combat aircraft have been destroyed, including around 15 percent of its pre-invasion multi-role and ground attack aircraft, including the more advanced Su-30SM and Su-34. Douglas Barry, a military aviation analyst at the IISS, believes at least 20 Su-34 strike aircraft have been lost, along with one or two of their top-of-the-line Su-35s. And if you're still counting, you can tack on a minimum of 80 combat helicopters. Russia's navy isn't doing any better. In April of 2022, the flagship of the Black Sea Fleet, the cruiser Moskva, was sunk by Ukrainian drone attacks, though Russia at first claimed it was due to a fire started by careless smokers. Following that meme show, the frigate Admiral Makarov assumed the role of flagship of the Black Sea Fleet, but it was attacked less than a month later in May of 2022. It's not confirmed, but the Makarov might now be inoperable. All told, the Russian Navy has lost 18 ships of various sizes and has had to pull all of its ships of any value back from the Western Black Sea due to fears of more air and sea drone attacks. Not a very good showing against a country that officially has no navy. Then there's the overall troop losses. According to several estimates, Russia has lost as many as 200,000 to 270,000 troops, either killed, wounded or missing or captured in the invasion of Ukraine. And with close to 2 million men of draftable age having left the country to avoid Putin's first conscription in 2022, those troops won't be easily replaced. Neither will the hundreds of trained pilots, nor the hundreds of highly trained elite paratroopers and special forces killed in the first days of the war in the failed attack on the Hostomel airport, and in the equally disastrous attempt to assassinate President Zelensky. And because the Russian army has never created an independent, think-for-yourself NCO cadre and must be led by higher leaders who do all the thinking for the frontline troops, an astounding 14 generals have been confirmed to have died in the fighting. As of just May of 2022, Moscow had admitted that they had lost more than 300 high-ranking officers, a third of them members of the senior staff, namely colonels, lieutenant colonels and majors. And this is only from a single year of combat against what is arguably a second-tier military, though Ukraine is punching way above its weight class. There are several reasons why Russia's military is doing so poorly. Institutional kleptocracy. Somewhere between 30% and 40% of Russia's annual military budget is siphoned off by oligarchs, commanders, and even Putin himself, who has an estimated fortune of over $200 billion. You can't expect your tank's reactive armor to operate when someone claimed to buy the explosives but instead put egg carton cardboard into the pouches where the explosives are supposed to go. Outdated tactics. With the serious degradation of its military, both in numbers and quality, Russia has come to rely more and more on World War I tactics, namely massed artillery barrages and human wave attacks. The Russian commanders issue top-down commands that often bear little to no awareness of the current battlefield's logistics. This stems in part from Russia's incapability of creating an educated and well-trained NCO corps, which all other Western nations rely on. The inability to adjust. Russia seems incapable of learning from its mistakes. It's fought battles where its tanks bunched up and became easy targets for Ukrainian artillery, aided by spotter drones or simply rolled through minefields without any concern for the consequences. We'll discuss one such example later on, in the Battle of the Sevyevsky Donets. This rigidity is another result of a lack of a properly trained NCO corps who might be able to adjust avenues of attack and better coordinate tactics at the point of opposition. The only element of the Russian armed forces that Putin seems able to rely on is his nuclear arm. And as we've already agreed, we're not including these in our discussions, for now at least. But Putin continues to rattle his nuclear sabers every chance he gets, as if that's the only way he can keep NATO and the US from placing boots on the ground in Ukraine. But it's clear from the battlefield that Ukraine needs no additional troops, just the advanced weaponry and ammunition that is already flowing into the country as we speak. There are three recent battles that showcase Russia's surprising ineptitude in modern warfare. The Battle for Antonov Airport. February 24, 2022. Within hours of President Putin's announcement of his invasion of Ukraine, sorry, his special military operation, a coordinated effort was made to land paratroopers, known as the VDV, 
and other special forces at Kyiv's Antonov Airport, otherwise known as the Hostomel Airport, named for the city in which it's located. An estimated 30 to 40 Russian helicopters led the airborne invasion, supported by a handful of fighter aircraft. If it had been successful, this operation would have paved the way for dozens of large Il-76 troop transports to land. Those planes would have carried thousands of reinforcements and would have then occupied a vital region within 10 kilometers of Ukraine's capital. Instead, Ukrainian resistance met the first attackers and, after the initial surprise wore off and Ukrainian mechanized reinforcements arrived, they managed to encircle the airport and eliminate at least 200 of the VDV in just a few days. Meanwhile, Ukrainian artillery cratered the runway, rendering it useless for the planned follow-on landing of the Il-76 transports. The VDV troops held on for weeks, supported by a few tanks and other vehicles that had broken through Ukrainian resistance northwest of Kyiv and had managed to link up with the Russian forces around the airfield, some of which had scattered into the nearby towns of Irpin and Bucha. However, the main column of Russian tanks and reinforcements heading south from Belarus, numbering up to 15,000 troops, never made it to the airport and were stuck in a traffic jam more than 40 kilometers long. In this ill-conceived, poorly supported and mismanaged attack, Putin wasted the best of his elite paratroops, as well as his chance for a quick, decapitating strike on the Ukrainian capital. His miscalculations of the strength and coordination of Ukrainian resistance, combined with his overconfidence about his own military's performance, were merely previews of the disasters that would unfold during the rest of his invasion of Ukraine, the Battle of the Sovietsky Donets. The first year of the invasion of Ukraine has displayed time and again the lack of military coordination on the part of the Russian forces, as well as their inability to adapt to the changing military environment during the heat of battle. Time and again, Russian forces will encounter an ambush, a minefield, or simply a well-prepared defense, and rather than regroup and try a different avenue of attack, will simply plow mindlessly ahead, regardless of the losses. One such event that perfectly encapsulates all the problems Russia is having with modern warfare is the well-documented disaster known as the Battle of the Sovietsky Donets, which occurred the 5th through the 13th of May 2022. In an effort to force a crossing of the Donetsk River in northeastern Ukraine, a Russian battalion tactical group, BTG, numbering between 1,000 and 1,500 troops, supported by tanks, armored personnel carriers, APCs, and artillery, placed a group of pontoons across the river near the small city of Sivyeski. They began to send tanks and APCs to the western side, while calling up additional vehicles on the eastern side to prepare to have them cross as well. But Ukraine had advanced warning of this attack, possibly due to satellite surveillance supplied by the US. In preparation, the Ukrainian armed forces brought up both tanks and artillery, with spotter drones overhead. When around half of the vehicles had crossed, Ukrainian artillery began pounding the two pontoon bridges already in place, isolating the forces that had already crossed. They also pounded the now massed vehicle pileup on the far side of the river, destroying a vast number of frontline combat vehicles. Rather than give up against a prepared and alert defensive formation, Russian commanders just continued to feed more forces into the cauldron. Some Russian military bloggers went beyond calling these decisions inept and suicidal and deemed them instead to be sabotage. When the surviving units finally pulled back the following week, Russia had lost over 70 tanks and other vehicles, and by some accounts more than 1,000 troops killed, wounded and missing. Retired British Major General Mick Ryan estimated that the defeat likely resulted in not just a BTG, but probably an entire brigade losing a large part of its combat power. While most Western militaries would see such a calamity as a reason to learn from such mistakes, the Russian command structure doesn't seem to know how to make adjustments. Additional major defeats where Russia seemed heedless of massive casualties occurred at regular intervals across the Ukrainian battlefield, including Kherson, Kharkiv, Zaporizhia, and Volodar. Not to mention the estimated 30 to 50,000 casualties Russia may have suffered in their months-long struggle to capture the fortified region around Bakhmut. Many observers will say that the Russian-Ukrainian war might not be a fair comparison to a possible Russian-US military encounter. Isn't there some event that would provide a better metric to compare the opposing militaries? As a matter of fact, there is. The so-called Battle for the Konoko Fields, also known as the Battle of Kasham, which occurred in Syria in 2018. This was the first hot encounter between US and Russian forces since the Cold War. The US had stationed a handful of US Marines and Army Special Forces about five miles east of the Euphrates River, 
close to a vital oil drilling and pumping station in eastern Syria to help support a small group of Syrian Democratic Forces SDF fighters, also defending the site primarily against ISIS threats in the region. Russian and US forces had previously agreed that a nominal dividing line between the two forces would be the Euphrates River. They had even set up a special hotline between the two areas' command units to make sure there wouldn't be any confusion on the ground, as the Russian troops were also ostensibly opposed to ISIS at the time. At around 5 a.m. on February 7, 2018, a force of some 250 mixed Russian Wagner mercenaries and Syrian pro-government militia attempted to cross the Euphrates southwest of Kasham. US forces fired a few artillery rounds to warn them off, and they did pull back. But later in the evening around 10 p.m., the US troops were surprised to detect a column of Russian T-72 tanks and support vehicles, along with as many as 500 soldiers, heading towards their position from the east side of the Euphrates. Sporadic artillery fire and mortar fire began to hit their positions as well. The US troops followed procedure and contacted their opposite numbers using the predetermined hotline, but the Russian commanders assured them that there were no Russian troops in the area. With that reassurance, the US troops called in massive air and artillery support involving F-15E and F-22 fighter jets, B-52 bombers, AC-130 gunships, AH-64 Apache attack helicopters, MQ-9 Reaper and RQ-7B shadow drones, in addition to M777 howitzer artillery and M142 HIMARS rockets. The Russian and Syrian forces never got to within rifle range of their US targets. Four hours later, when the fighting was over, more than 100 of the attacking forces had been killed, though some estimates put that loss at closer to 330. The only casualties on the US SDF side was a single wounded SDF soldier. The lopsided nature of the encounter due to primarily the overwhelming and accurately directed air and artillery strikes supplied by the US underscored the uneven nature of the current US and Russian military forces, as well as their relative abilities to use combined arms in a coordinated fashion. The massive response was also seen as a deliberate warning to Russia not to take the US or their allies lightly. That leads us inescapably to another interesting question. Could the US on its own invade and conquer the country of Russia? Alternatively, could the US, with NATO's help, conquer Russia? Bluntly, right now there's no way the US, even with NATO's help, could physically invade and conquer Russia. Even if Russia failed to use their nukes, and you can be certain they would, there's simply no way the vast country of Russia, stretching through 11 time zones, could ever be fully occupied and pacified. Hold on though, let's break this answer down and then we can talk about some other ways the US could possibly, actually, very probably destroy Russia. It's becoming clear in the modern age that no moderately well-supplied country would be able to be occupied and defeated as long as their people maintained the will to fight. A perfect example is the relatively tiny country of Vietnam. They were one of the first countries to soundly defeat the Mongol Empire in the 13th century and resisted French occupation right up until the Japanese invaded them in 1940. After the fall of Japan in 1945, they went on the offensive to drive the French out of their country. And when they were successful and the US tried to defend the area of South Vietnam, they fought for more than a decade before driving the US out as well, despite suffering as many as a million casualties. Cambodia next thought they could occupy Vietnam's Mekong Delta. But in a mere two weeks, the Vietnamese routed the attackers and occupied the capital, Phnom Penh, which they held until 1988. China then invaded, thinking that they could impose their will on the ruling Vietnamese government. But the Vietnamese went toe-to-toe -to -toe with the mighty Chinese army and after some brief but intense fighting, managed to force them to withdraw, though China considered the event merely a short, punitive expedition. Such determination to defend one's homeland would undoubtedly be faced in Russia as well, but of an order of magnitude far greater. Many segments of Russia see the current invasion of Ukraine and the implied aim of NATO to hang a strategic defeat around Putin's neck as one of an existential crisis for their country. Since Russian media is nothing more than an echo chamber for their dictator-in-chief, most commentators mirror Putin's own comments when he says that in light of such a defeat, I do not even know if such an ethnic group as the Russian people will be able to survive in the form in which it exists today. You can expect that, just as they did with their Herculean efforts to defend their country against the onslaught of Nazi Germany in World War II, Russia will fight on against any invasion, no matter the costs, the consequences, or the forces arrayed against them. They might even find a willing ally in China, who has been eyeing sections of Russia's Far East territories around Vladivostok that as recently as the 1850s were part of Greater China. 
it's entirely possible that China would be willing to help support the defense of Russia in exchange for what they currently consider historical Chinese territory. There is evidence that China has decided it's in their best interest to keep Russia as an intact nation in order to divide Western opposition. Both countries share an intense dislike of what they perceived as US hegemony throughout the world, and now that Russia has seen its oil and natural gas outlets in the West curtailed by sanctions, by necessity, they've had to turn to China and India as their two primary sources for exploiting petrochemicals. Even closer cooperation in the future is only inevitable. But wait, there's one more option. What if the US managed to topple the Russian government? This may be the trickiest of the three topics to answer. In short, yes, the US could probably topple the Putin government at any time if they wanted to. There was a recent event that showcased just how precise US strikes have become, an event that may have led Putin to decide to travel in a special armored train and to spend much of his time in isolated bunkers in Siberia, far from the active front lines. On August 2, 2022, the US sent a pair of specially modified Hellfire missiles to take out Ayman al-Zawahiri, one of the Al-Qaeda leaders responsible for planning various attacks on US and Western targets, including the 9-11 attacks, the bombing of the USS Cole, multiple bombings of US embassies in Africa, and others. He was tracked to a residence in Kabul, in the middle of a densely populated area. But the two drones were so precise that the US claimed Zawahiri was the only casualty of the operation. According to published reports, he was taken out while he stood on the second floor balcony of the residence with the missiles equipped with Ginsu knife-like projections. The strike was publicized in a series of press conferences, with additional US government officials warning that no matter how long it takes, no matter where you hide, if you are a threat to our people, the United States will find you and take you out. No doubt Putin took that threat seriously. But US military and diplomatic policy has matured since the 1950s and 60s when the CIA routinely toppled governments, many of them democratically elected, in countries like Iran, South Vietnam, Chile, Guatemala, the Congo, and others. Nowadays, the US prefers to let its military-industrial complex do the talking, such as when they toppled Saddam's regime in Iraq. In retrospect, despite the overwhelming military victory the US achieved, the end result was ultimately seen by many as seriously flawed as the US had no plan to replace the removed Iraqi government with any kind of stable and reliable replacement. And that may be the one main reason why the US doesn't want to topple the Putin dictatorship. There are fears that whoever might replace him could be far worse. The one element of his arsenal that Putin has dared not yet use is his nuclear arsenal. He probably knows that as long as he doesn't employ nukes, then the West will worry he's the only thing holding back a massive nuclear war. He's betting that the US and the West will worry that whoever comes next might not hold back. And so, we've come full circle. It's clear that the one ace in the hole that Russia still holds onto is its nuclear deterrent. Putin dare not use them, for fear that doing so will unleash a horrific response from the West. But Putin has to threaten to use them in fear that their possible use is the only thing keeping NATO from sending actual troops to drive the Russian invaders out of Ukraine. And the West dare not take Putin out directly, for fear that his replacement might be willing to use nukes in an act of suicidal revenge. And so, the world balances on a precarious knife's edge, closer to a nuclear holocaust than we've been since the Cuban Missile Crisis of the early 1960s. It would be best if all sides could take one giant step back from the precipice, but Putin seems incapable of backing down, and the brave Ukrainians are determined to take their country back, as well they should. The most likely outcome is that some oligarch will find a willing accomplice in Putin's cook staff, and the Russian president will succumb to a bout of severe intestinal distress following which, some level-headed replacement will endeavor to repair the massive damage Putin's done both to Ukraine and to his own country. At least, that's what many sane people hope. Don't forget, before he was the leader of the Wagner Group, the oligarch Yevgeny Prigozhin had a very special nickname, Putin's chef. But what do you think? Could the US military conquer Russia all on its own? How would they do it? Let us know in the comments, and don't forget to subscribe for more military analysis from military experts.